Japan and the way of the samurai, honor and tradition, so very, very important in Japanese culture. Death before dishonor was the code of the samurai. For centuries, Japan was ruled by a military dictatorship, the shogunate, and the samurais were the enforcers of this rule. You could and would die for even insulting a samurai. The samurai were judge, jury, and executioner. The, the warrior fought for his lord, fought for his country. His days and ways were highly ritualized, molded by Buddhist, Confucian, and Shintoist philosophy. The sword was his soul, and he carried it with him throughout his days and slept with it by his side throughout his nights. The samurai traced their origins all the way back to the end of the 8th century, back to the Heyun period military campaigns to subdue the indigenous Amishi people of the Toyoku region of Japan. Mercenary warriors were increasingly being hired by wealthy landowners who had grown independent of the central government and built armies for their own protection. These armies grew into more and more powerful clans of fighters and soon these clans would become giant samurai clans who would dominate Japan. A fascinating history and we explore it today in this Land of the Rising Sun edition of Time Suck. You're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> Hail Nimrod, I'm Dan Cummins, a.k.a. the Reverend Dr. Master Sucker Esquire, the fourth, a.k.a. fourth leg of Bojangles, a.k.a. Sir Sucks-a-Lot, a.k.a. He whoeth sucketh the mosteth. And you are listening to Time Suck. And I hope you are a member of the cult of the curious. Join our weird cult. Join it. Uh, recording in Los Angeles today in, in the rare Los Angeles basement. Not a city known for basements because of all the uh, the earthquake shenanigans. But in a basement today, uh, hope that Reverend Dr. Uh, Paisley, back in the Idaho Suck Dungeon, is able to sweeten the sound enough to turn today's suck into some sweet ear candy. Thanks to the Time Suckers who came out to the Hollywood Improv on a Wednesday night last night, uh, as I record this. Uh, two nights ago is uh, the first of you hear this. Thanks in advance to anyone who shows up in Oxnard at Levity Live this weekend. Uh, traveling with Queen of the Suck Lindsay this week, which is fantastic. Uh, thank you to, uh, to Matt, by the way, in Hollywood, who... Uh, who gave me the, another military challenge coin. Man, I, I'm getting quite the collection and uh, uh, very appreciative of that. And, and thank you all again for your service. Uh, so glad that uh, the suck seems to be really spreading uh, within uh, the military and within law enforcement. Uh, big fans of both. Big fans of both to keep us safe. Very important roles. Get shit on a lot for whatever reason uh, in the media. I shouldn't say for whatever reason, for, for valid reasons, but a few bad apples. A few bad apples. Uh, spoiling, you know, uh, a, a bunch that is, in my experience, mostly uh, a people of, of great integrity. Anyway, uh, yeah, Traveling with Queen of the Suck, uh, Lindsay, this week is fantastic. Uh, my most recent album, Maybe I'm the Problem, drops on vinyl tomorrow, September 15th, noon Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern time via Romanus Records. Scoop that up. Uh, and I, I do love the vinyl. Uh, I, guess I, I guess I'm a little hipster after all. What am I talking about? Like, I just realized that. I've, I've been hipster the whole time to a certain, to a certain degree. I'm a, I'm a bigger hipster. Um, but yeah, man, I oh, love the, love the, there is truly is something about uh, listening to stuff on vinyl. And it's so cheap. I think I've said that before. Um, like, especially if you get into the used vinyl, that's what's really cool about it, I think. I mean, you're like, oh, you know, but it's, I guess you can, uh, you know, stream things for free, but then there's commercials and different stuff and they have to compress the sound quality you know, uh, so much to make it streamable that it does really lose a lot of the nuances. But you can get, you know, a pretty cheap record player and you can go to your to your local record shop or really go to your local thrift shop and a lot of them have like a used record section and you can find gems for like 50 cents, a buck. Maybe they look a little scratched. Mm, just get some, uh, just get some of that record juice from your vinyl shop, get some of that vinyl cleaner. And you can just kind of, you know, brush it around. You can you can brush all those impurities out, and it's just mm, mwah, sweet, sweet sounds. Uh, anyway, link to those uh, to the custom limited edition pressings of, of my album uh, in the episode description. Uh, very excited not only for Oxnard this week, but uh, but to head back to Portland, Oregon this this September twenty seventh through the 29th, back at Helium, Flat Earth tour, stand up shows, and a live Metamoros Narco Satanist Cult podcast on September thirtieth. Uh, excited to do that topic again. That's the uh, that's the live only topic for the rest of this year. Back to California, October fifth and sixth, uh, where today's cult story, or uh, not today's, uh, last week's cult story uh, began again in Huntington Beach, and uh, beat the rec room, dishing out counterculture, stand up rhetoric, some flatter stuff, and more. Then I'll be back to the Northwest, hitting the Tacoma Comedy Club in Tacoma, Washington, October eleventh to thirteenth. 
was another live Metamoros Narco Satanist Cult on the 14th. And those will be my only Seattle area shows this year. Uh, the rest of the year's tour dates on dancummins.tv. And now let's get into today's suck. I want to say take it easy. Take it easy on me with this week's pronunciations. I looked up, oh, so many words, so many words. Uh, but I also didn't quite have time to become fluent in Japanese. So, uh, so easy, Tiger, easy. Now let's leave wherever the hell you are and head over to Japan, unless you're in Japan. Then you stay put. <laughs> to understand the samurai, you really have to understand ancient Japanese culture. And, and I gotta say, I'm, I'm glad I got a little bit of a jump on this suck. Because it wasn't easy for me to start working on. I really had to get over some stuff. Uh, I, I've hated Japan and, and hated Japanese people ever since I read about how for hundreds of years, they routinely ate Christian babies in order to gain magical martial arts abilities. And what? Wait, what? That was that was nonsense. Uh, I only said that hoping that maybe like one new listener would stop listening after hearing that and just wonder if it was true for a while. Just Be Becky, Becky, did you did you know why Japanese people are good at karate? They eat Christian babies, Becky. No, it's no, it's true. Someone said it. Someone said it once, so it has to be true. No, uh, I'm glad I got a nice jump on this one because Japan's culture is so very different from uh, from my own American culture. Radically different. Uh, it took me a bit to wrap my head around it. I I feel like I still have so much to learn. I feel like I can, you know, uh, do, do, do decent job with today's narrative. But man, it's uh, it's very very different. Like I learned a little bit about Japanese culture in the uh, uh, Okikihara uh, Suicide Forest Suck. Uh, I learned so much more for this suck. The culture of Japan just incredibly unique. It developed until the end of the 16th century, uh, completely outside of any Judeo-Christian or Muslim influence whatsoever, which is incredibly rare in the history of the world. Uh, even more rare when Europeans did arrive, just a few Portuguese showed up. Uh, they didn't show up as con conquerors. Uh, they were kicking ass all over the planet, but they quickly realized that Japan was not theirs for the taking. The samurai warriors ruling and guarding Japan were a formidable force and they weren't about to allow foreign invaders to infiltrate their island. In fact, shortly after the arrival of Europeans, the Japanese minimized contact uh, until there was virtually no contact with outsiders until the mid-19th century. Uh, that is not the way the shit went down uh, basically anywhere else on Earth. Uh, anywhere else on the, uh, for sure, definitely not flat Earth. Uh, I found a map online that listed which countries are either European or have fallen under either total or partial control of a European nation, between the 16th century and the 1960s, it's nuts. All of North and South America, right? Of course, under European control at some point. Uh, Guyana, aka French Guyana, still under European control. It's, it remains part of the nation of France to this day. I did not know that. Uh, I had no idea that people living in South America were members of the European Union right now. Uh, all of Africa has fallen under European control except the small... Uh, West African nation of Liberia. And Liberia only escaped European control because it was backed by the United States. It began as a settlement of the American uh, colonization, colonization society in the 19th century who thought that freed African Americans would fare better in Africa than America. So while not technically ruled by Europe, uh, it was founded by Americans who, you know, uh, virtually ran it and were culturally, obviously, uh, very much Judeo Christian. Also, I should point out that Ethiopia was only ruled by Italy very, very briefly. However, for the point I'm making about Japan, Ethiopia's culture also uh, shaped mightily by Christians, Jews, and especially Muslims. Uh, if you want to learn more about Europe's influence on Africa, we did a whole suck on it. Uh, suck 72, the colonial devastation of Africa. Uh, Australia and the South Pacific Islands, all under the thumb of European colonialism at some point, uh, its cultures you know, uh, either derivative of or heavily influenced by Europe, you know, outside of obviously a, a few small jungle tribes that remain kind of independent to this day. Uh, the Middle East, all under either outright European control or strong European influence and or partial control at some point. Uh, most of Asia, such as India and Pakistan, ruled by Europeans for long stretches, heavily influenced culturally by Europeans, Afghanistan, uh, Bhutan, Nepal, uh, remained um, technically independent, but were essentially ruled by British proxies at various points. Afghanistan also essentially controlled by Russia at other points. Uh, Mongolia, strongly influenced slash controlled by Russia at various moments in its history. Uh, even the great and powerful nation of China, while never conquered outright by the West, 
uh, you know, uh, made several historical concessions to the West. Cities and trade ports given to colonial powers like Hong Kong, which actually belonged to the British until 1997. Missionaries and other Western travelers bouncing around that nation for, for centuries. And then there's Korea and Thailand. Now, Thailand remained independent of Europe only because the British and French empires decided to let it remain independent. Uh, they both chose to kind of use it as a buffer between British-controlled Burma and uh, French-controlled, you know, French Indochina. But Thailand's mainland location opened it up to tons of traffic from Europeans and their culture and their religions. Uh, the same can be said kind of for Korea, although Korea, you know, made a much greater effort to suppress Western influence than Thailand did. And, and, and Korea, like Thailand, shares borders with other Asian nations. Uh, so the cultures of those nations came into frequent contact with the cultures of Thailand and Korea. And clearly North Korea has been extremely isolationist since the 1950s, but we're talking about history long before the 20th century. And then finally, uh, there is Japan. That's, uh, that's all that's left after all, uh, all those other countries and you know continents described. Japan's culture developed quite literally, as I'm guessing you know, uh, on an island, but it also developed figuratively on an island. Uh, while Japan did engage in limited trade with a few other nations, uh, primarily China and Korea, for centuries, it also shut off its borders to outside influence. Uh, you know, um, for like a century and a half, more tightly than any other kingdom did in the history of the world, for a, a large nation, it, it truly uh, developed in a bubble unlike any other modern nation has. Like from, from 1639 CE to 1853 CE, Japan actually instituted a formal policy of isolationism. This is that century and a half I was just referring to called uh, Sakoku. Uh, it legally mandated minimal outside cultural contact. Japan traded during this period with the outside world primarily through only uh, one harbor, primarily yeah, the, uh, the Nagasaki Harbor, in Nagasaki, trade with China was permitted, uh, a little bit, you know, with Korea, uh, a little bit of trade with the uh, the Inu people, some of whom were indigenous to Japan, uh, some indigenous to Russia. Yeah, and, and I said, like, Korea, Korea's a uh, Joseon uh, dynasty. And then the tiniest of tiny windows opened to trade with the West. This is uh, hilarious to me. There was a 2.2-acre artificial island uh, formed by digging a canal through part of a small peninsula in the Bay of Nagasaki that Dutch merchants were allowed to use as a trading post. Think about how tiny that is. 2.2 acres. Th that is smaller than a fair amount of people's yards back where I live in Idaho. Not, not even joking. <laughs> like crescent-shaped, 390 feet wide, uh, 250 feet deep. It was built originally to house Portuguese traders at the end of the uh, 16th century. So, so um, they'd keep their religion and, you know, and cultural ideas away from the local population. Uh, while the Portuguese left after just a few decades, the Dutch arrived, kind of took over and remained. Only about 20 Dutch would be stationed there at any given time. And a locked gate prevented them from leaving their small barracks and exploring Japan. Like even the, even the 20 dudes who got to stay in these tiny little barracks weren't allowed to go like explore the mainland. Like, nope. You fucking stay in your 2.2 acres. Every ship that came into the Nagasaki Harbor, uh, thoroughly inspected, religious books confiscated, as were uh, other books, you know, uh, or objects deemed culturally threatening. Uh, even the 20, again, uh, Dutch on the island, forbidden from holding any kind of religious ceremony uh, for themselves, even within their little barracks. They were closely watched even there by Japanese supervisors. They monitored the island uh, daily, beginning in the 18th century, only two ships per year were even allowed to dock there. So as you can see, Japan did not fuck around when it came to closely guarding their culture. Uh, so let's look into how that culture began and how it led to the age of the samurai and all that entails in today's first of two. Actually, we're a little different structure. First of two, Time Suck Timelines. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a Time Suck Timeline. Roughly 35,000 years ago, in 33,000 BCE, it's believed that the first humans, Paleolithic people, made it from mainland China to the island of Japan, and it's thought that they traveled by jet ski. Uh, they brought with them early iPads that were pretty cool, but didn't have like HD FaceTime cameras or, you know, really good games at first. And of course, that is not true, but I do like to pretend that the Japanese are so much more technologically advanced than the rest of the world that they actually did have iPads and jet skis 35,000 years ago. Uh, no, they floated over on, uh, I'm assuming, super shitty boats, uh, the kind that probably sunk often, 
uh, where, you know, you're always one bad storm away from a terrible, terrible death. <laughs> but they made it. At the end of the last Ice Age, uh, roughly around 10,000 BCE, uh, a culture called the uh, Juman developed. Uh, and during the Juman period, the inhabitants of Japan lived by fishing, hunting, and gathering, as did much of the world. This period is named after the cord markings, uh, Juman, on the pottery they produced. Then, uh, in the uh, Yayoi period, beginning around 300 BCE and lasting several centuries, uh, rice cultivation was introduced from the Korean Peninsula. Uh, an account of Japan in a, in a Chinese historical document of the 3rd century um, describes a, a queen named uh, uh, named uh, Himoki. Uh, he, no, he, he, uh, Himiko. Himiko, there we go. Himiko ruling over a country called uh, Yamutai in the first era of recorded Japanese history. And then we jump to uh, uh, 250 CE. The, the Kofun era lasted from 250 CE to 538 uh, CE and was characterized by large burial mounds or tumuli. Uh, the Kofun were headed by a class of aristocratic warlords uh, who had adopted many Chinese customs and innovations. Uh, the Japanese religion of Shintoism likely began to really take shape during this period. Hard to say with certainty since it began as an oral tradition and may have existed in some form going back to prehistoric times. Shinto means the way of the gods. More on Shintoism and how it shaped the code of the samurai and Japanese culture a little bit later. Uh, 538 CE, the Asuka period began. Now, it looks like this word looks like a suka, but you know, found a lot of uh, various sources that said uh, Asuka. Uh, the uh, Asuka translates in English to never enough dick. And this period was marked by Japanese women marrying on average five dudes each. Uh, it was a period of unparalleled sexual expression and decadence for women who were uh, allowed to divorce their husbands for poor sexual performance or for having penises that were either weird looking or not hard or long enough. And since Japanese penises are statistically the world's smallest uh, by quite a bit, this had a devastating effect on Japanese culture. Roughly 70% of men were abandoned by their dick-hungry, sex-greedy wives during this period. Uh, <laughs> kidding, of course. Kidding on numerous levels, actually. Uh, women were not sexually controlling during this era. And science going against stereotype. Uh, Japanese men listening to the podcast, get get ready uh, for, for, for some positive information, Japanese men do not have tiny wings. According to a 2012 study of 500,000 grown men from around the round globe, Japanese men ranked 10th with an average erection length of 5.33 inches, just a bit longer than U.S. wings, which clocked in at 11th with an average length of 5.08 inches. So who's number one? The Republic of the Congo with an average erection length of 14 inches, an average circumference of 9.4 inches. Uh, <laughs> kidding again. Kidding again about the, the length of the Congo. That's way too much dick for anybody who's not a masochist. No, 7.05 inches was number one. That was the Republic of Congo. Uh, FYI, FYI, my penis uh, measures somewhere around 20 inches long when, listen, when I measure from the small of my back down around in between my legs and, and, and then up to the tip from the grundle. <laughs> and... Um, and now I'll stop before everyone quits listening and unsubscribes. Uh, and I and I meant with that twenty. I meant like from the yeah, small of the back, around around through the grundle, uh, up to the tip. Okay, five thirty eight CE, the Asuka period really did begin. This period uh, draws its name from the de facto imperial uh, capital at that time, uh, Asuka. Uh, Buddhism came to Japan during the Asuka period and influenced the uh, formalization of the native Shinto religion. You know, it's, it's still shaping and molding the Chinese writing system. Also made its way. Onto the island, given birth to Japan's own written language, which uh, would be, uh, you know, initially derivative of Chinese. Japanese society divided into powerful and rival clans during this era. Uh, the Buddhist Soga clan then took control of most of Japan in 587 CE, ruled for nearly 60 years. Uh, one leader of this clan, Prince uh, Shotoku, uh, ruled from 594 to 622, authored the 17 Article Constitution, a Confucian-inspired code of conduct for officials and citizens. He inspired the name of the country, Japan, which comes from the, uh, the phrase Land of the Rising Sun when he wrote an insulting letter to a Chinese uh, ruler that started off stating, the sovereign of the land where the sun rises is sending this mail to the sovereign of the land where the sun sets. And apparently that was an insult uh, because it indicated that the sun's full strength originated in Japan and that China received, you know, like a, like a half sun, like a waning limp sun. Japan's sun fucking rough, just rock hard. Fully erect. Uh, China's son just like, bah, bah, bah. Uh, so Japan, <laughs> starting off with some smack talk. 
645 CE, the Soga clan is overthrown by the Fujiwara clan, uh, whose first leader, Emperor uh, Kotoku, uh, wrote the Taika reforms immediately after taking over. Now, these reforms focused on land reform based on Confucian philosophies, also enhanced the power of the imperial court uh, by taking away power from regional leaders and making the imperial court the place you had to go to settle legal disputes and appeal to the government. Uh, the land reform of this era adopted from China is now known as the equal field system. And this is kind of how feudalism really gets down moving in Japan. This system worked on the basis that, uh, that all land was owned by the government, which would then assign it to individual families. Every individual was entitled to a certain amount of land, the amount depending on their ability to supply labor. For example, able-bodied men received approximately 2.7 acres while women received a little bit less. More land was granted per ox owned by the family. After death, the land would then revert back to the state to be reassigned to the next generation. Uh, although provisions were allowed to, uh, for some inheritance of land that required like long-term development of certain crops. Uh, despite these reforms, most of the islands of Japan still operated under, you know, uh, operated regionally, excuse me, and it would take centuries to really consolidate power in a way similar to the to the Empire of China. Uh, 710 CE, the, the government constructed a grandiose new capital at uh, Hayukyo, uh, modern Nara, uh, modeled after the capital of the Chinese Tang Dynasty. During this period, the first two books produced in Japan appeared, the uh, Kojiki and uh, Nihon Shoki, uh, which contain chronicles of legendary accounts of early Japan. And his creation myth, uh, which describes the imperial line as descendants of the gods. This is kind of important in the, in the development of the ethos, the loyalty kind of uh, to Japan in the samurai code. A mythology that would really help kind of uh, uh, fuel intense Japanese nationalism as time went on. You know, just just kind of worshipping themselves in a sense. Uh, the aristocratic class practiced Buddhism, also uh, Chinese calligraphy. Agricultural villagers followed the tenets of Shintoism, which was starting to grow in cultural importance. And again, more on Shintoism later, I promise. Uh, further land reform occurred during this era that would lead directly to the rise of the shamra uh, samurai. Uh, decrees in 723 CE held that newly developed lands could be inherited for three generations, while a later decree in 743 CE allowed for these developed lands to be held in perpetuity, right? So now you can have private ownership in perpetuity. Uh, this is very important uh, to kind of like how the how the, the samurai would, would develop. By 800 CE, the whole Confucian land redistribution scheme had just been practically uh, totally abandoned. During this period, Japan also suffered a series of natural disasters, including wildfires, droughts, famines, outbreaks of disease, such as a, a smallpox epidemic that killed over a quarter of the population. Uh, Emperor Shomu, who ruled from 724 to 749 CE, feared his lack of piousness had caused the trouble and so increased the government's promotion of Buddhism during this period including the construction of the temple uh, Totaji. Uh, additional provincial Buddhist temples known as uh, Kokobunji were built all over Japan. Every prov uh, province was uh, was uh, to build a monastery and a nunnery, uh, like the, the Buddhist uh, nunneries, uh, each with a seven-story pagoda, each housing a statue of uh, Shakyamuni, uh, Shakyamuni uh, Buddha. Shakyamuni Buddha. Uh, Buddha. And, uh, each monastery was to have 20 monks, each nunnery 10 nuns, whose constant task would be to recite the scriptures, offer up prayers for the welfare of the nation, right? Just that whole kind of ancient thing of like, please don't let another disease wipe us out. Uh, just as the temporal uh, world has it had its governors in each province to attend to its administrative and judicial matters, so the spiritual world would have officially appointed monks and nuns distributed evenly among the provinces to attend to the spiritual needs of the Japanese people at this time. Uh, 794 CE, the Heyun era began with the ascension of the Emperor Kamu, who shifted the capital to Heyun, uh, present Kyoto. Uh, Kamu was uh, less enthralled with Buddhism than his predecessors and began to dismantle the culture's Buddhist infrastructure. Uh, those provincial Buddhist temples had gradually amassed vast wealth over the past several decades, and the monks acquired uh, high political positions and began to interfere in secular affairs. And then there was a movement to counter such abuses among the uh, uh, aristocracy, and Buddhist influence now begins to wane. Japan's unique culture develops rapidly during the Heyun era, which would last all the way until 1185 CE, which would be the beginning of the shogunate. Uh, the imperial court pumped out enduring art, poetry, and prose during this period. The samurai warrior class developed as well. Samurai, yeah, buddy, we're almost there. Almost there. Almost truly going to dive into today's topic. Uh, the new government consisted of the emperor, his high ministers, a council of state, and eight ministries, uh, which with the help of an extensive bureaucracy, ruled over some 7 million people spread over 68 provinces at that time, each ruled by a regional governor and then further divided into eight or nine districts. 
Now Japan is truly becoming a feudal, feudal nation. While noble landowners are spending more and more time in the new capital, in and around the imperial court, you know, working on their fucking art, working on their drawings, working on their poetry, enjoying being rich and petulant, uh, the vast majority of Japan's population is working the land, either for themselves or for the estates that are popping up now. Uh, and, and they're burdened by banditry, by excessive taxation. Rebellions begin to occur with greater and greater frequency. Uh, after this policy of, you know, redistributing public lands, the whole equal field system, after that went away, you know, the, the proportion of land held in private hands would naturally start to increase, and some people would get more than others. By the 12th century, 50% uh, of land would be held in private estates, and, and many of these given special dispensation through favors uh, or, or due to religious reasons and would become exempt from paying taxes. So the situation causes a serious dent in the state's finances. Wealthy landowners, uh, they're claiming more and more new land. They're developing it. They're increasing their wealth. Uh, they're less dependent on the government. They're starting to feel more powerful than the government, than the, than the emperor. You know, this, this uh, widey, or excuse me, ever widening gap between the haves and have nots is growing. Uh, also, many of these now large estate owners, uh, they're spending more and more time away from the land they own. A uh, large number of them actually residing at the court in Heyunkyo. Uh, this meant that the estates were managed by subordinates who were now seeking to increase their own power. And as time goes on, the nobility and the emperor become more and more separated from everyday life. Most commoners' contact with central authority becomes limited just to paying the local tax collector. And, and, and as, all, after, as all these nobles spend less and less time on their own land uh, in the beginning of the 9th century, private armies are now being formed in order to protect the interests of the shoin, the, the nobles who spent most of their time away at the imperial court. And this is the beginning of the samurai, a, a name which literally translates as attendant with the verb uh, samurai meaning to serve. Uh, there were other classes of warriors, you know, they're like soldiers, common soldiers, but samurai were the were the only one with the connotation of serving the imperial court. Samurai were employed by feudal lords, the daimyo, uh, to defend the territories against rivals, uh, to fight enemies uh, identified by the imperial court and battle with hostile tribes and bandits. Uh, during the Heyun era, the, the, the power of the empire is slowly being chipped away uh, as these different, you know, regional, you know, landowning clans are getting more and more powerful. There's one uh, family in particular that really started to chip away at the, uh, at the uh, emperor, the, the Fujiwara clan. Uh, during this area, members of this clan started taking over more and more Japan's political offices. They started, uh, you know, they're marrying off a fair amount of their daughters to Japan's emperors. Many of these emperors are taking the throne as children and wild children. Uh, these kids regent, the, the Seto, uh, would become the de facto emperor and, and members of the Fujiwara clan usually filled this advisory role, which really was kind of the real power. Uh, when the emperor reached adulthood, he'd be advised by a new political position created during this era, the uh, Kampu, uh, Kampaku, uh, also usually a member of the Fujiwara clan. And so the rising dominance of this clan does not go unnoticed, doesn't go unchallenged. Emperor uh, Shirakawa uh, who ruled from 1073 to 1087, begins to uh, assert his independence from Fujiwara by abdicating the throne in 1087 CE and, and allowing his son, Horikawa, to reign under his supervision. And then this strategy of retired emperors still in effect governing became known as cloistered government uh, as the emperor usually remained behind closed doors in a monastery. It added another wheel to the already complex machine of Japanese government. Meanwhile, back in the provinces, you know, new power players are getting stronger and stronger, left to their own devices, fueled by blood from minor nobility, produced by this process of dynastic shedding. Which, and that was when an emperor or aristocrat just had too many kids, and uh, a lot of them were removed from lines of inheritance. Uh, two important groups evolved, the Minamoto uh, and the Tara clans. And with their own private armies of samurai, they become important rivals to the power of the Fujiwara clan. And then in 1156, a dispute over succession to the throne erupts and the two rival clans, um, you know, uh, or two rival, um, excuse me, claimants to the throne, Emperor uh, Go uh, Shirakawa and Emperor uh, Sutoku, hire the Taira and Minamoto clans in the hopes of securing the throne by military force. This is going to lead to the shogunate. Uh, during this war, the samurais of the Tara clan, led by Tara, Tara no Kiyoro uh, Mori, uh, defeat the samurais of the Minamoto clan. Uh, Kira Mori uh, installs his grandson, uh, Antuko, uh, as emperor. While the Minamoto clan has been defeated, they weren't destroyed, though. And, 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 and they fight against this new emperor, leading to the Heiji Rebellion in 1160. The clans would battle back and forth for over two decades, ending in 1185 
when the, the head of the uh, uh, the winning clan, the, the Minamoto clan, Minamoto no uh, Yoritomo, and his family become the new de facto rulers of Japan. And by 1192, uh, Minamoto would radically change the government of Japan, creating a new system that would last all the way until 1868, the shogunate. Okay, so this fir- this first period of the shogunate lasts from 1185 when they you know win the war to 1333. This is the uh, Kamakura period. Now, during this period, the samurai fought off Mongol invasion attempts launched by Kublai Khan in both 1274 and 1281. And yeah, and this and this is the beginning of like when the samurais they are in charge now. You know, not not like you know l- lowly samurais, but they're yeah, we'll talk about the social structure here in just a little bit. But this is when now uh, Japan is a feudal uh, military dictatorship. You know, under the shogunate, uh, impressive that they were able to uh, fight off Kublai Khan. By the way, considering the Mongols were just kicking everyone's ass back then, nature did help a little bit with their defense. Uh, you know, they got that island, so that creates a little bit of a, a barrier to conquering them. And then the Mongols' large fleet, after being fought off by the samurai, uh, actually destroyed by typhoons just off Japan's coast on August fifteenth. Uh, from that deadly August afternoon in 1281 down to present time, the divine wind that destroyed the Mongol invasions of Japan has been uh, known by its more popular name, Kamikaze. Uh, in 1133, or excuse me, in 1333, Emperor uh, Godaigo attempts to restore power back to a civilian government. Doesn't work. Uh, his attempt had failed by 1336, and uh, the uh, Ashikaga shogunate takes power and would rule until 1575. Now, this period saw a lot of samurai versus samurai fighting. In 1338, uh, you know, uh, the one shogun captures the capital of Kyoto, installs a new emperor. The current emperor has to flee to the southern city of uh, Yoshino. Uh, following his escape, there was a prolonged period of fighting between the north and south in the uh, Daimyo and their samurai armies who aligned with each. Uh, this would last all the way until 1392. In 1467, another civil war would break out over who would succeed the, roli- uh, the ruling shogun. Uh, Kyoto burned to the ground as Daimyo's, uh, uh, you know, took sides and samurais battle samurai. By the time the succession was settled in 1477, the shogun had lost all power over the Daimyo, who, who now ruled hundreds of independent states throughout Japan. There was this period where there's called the Warring States, uh, where the Daimyo's fought amongst themselves for control of the country. So it's basically like a whole bunch of little governors, each with their own army of samurai, always just battling each other for control over, you know, portions of the nation. Uh, amid this ongoing virtual anarchy and warfare, Portuguese traders land in 1543. They're the ones who bring that musket to Japan, uh, bring, you know, firearms. By 1556, there'd be 300,000 muskets in use by Japanese armies. We'll talk about how that affects uh, the, the samurai much later. F- by 1568, Japan had reunified under two powerful warlords, uh, Oda uh, Nobunaga and uh, Toyotomi uh, Hideyoshi. War would eventually break out between those loyal to one clan or the other. And after the Battle of Sekigahara in 1600, the Tokugawa shogunate came to power and would rule from the new capital now of Edo. They moved the capital to Edo, which is now Tokyo, until the end of the samurai period when power was transferred back to the emperor in 1868. Uh, And then the emperor would remain in Kyoto uh, during the Edo period. And during this period, Edo became the most populous uh, city in the world also. Uh, The Tokugawa shogunate went to great lengths to suppress social unrest, harsh penalties, including crucifixion, beheading, death by boiling, they didn't fuck around, uh, were decreed for even minor offenses. Uh, Criminals of high social class were often given the option of uh, seppuku, which was that self-disembowelment we talked about in the uh, Aoki Gahara uh, suicide forest suck, you know, the samurai suicide. Uh, uh, Christianity, which was seen as a a potential threat, was gradually clamped down until finally after the Christian-led Shimbabara Rebellion of 1638, the religion was completely outlawed in the country. So it really did develop really outside of Judeo-Christian where they just like squashed that shit out entirely uh, to prevent further foreign ideas from sowing dissent. You know, that thing we talked about earlier, the uh, Sakuku, uh, Sakoku isolationist policy is implemented that we spoke of. You know, Japanese people not allowed to travel abroad either during this period. Uh, not allowed to return from overseas if they <laughs> they did leave. Not allowed to build ocean going vessels. Uh, only and again, only uh, Europeans allowed on Japanese soil were the were the Dutch, who only had that one tiny two point two acre trading post. And again, China and Korea, you know, allowed to do a little bit of trading. And now that we have a basic understanding of the broad strokes of Japanese history, let's leave this first timeline. I know you probably have some questions, uh, some things I mentioned that may not make a lot of sense. Hopefully, I'll clear that up in this in this little next section. Uh, describing how the Shogunate worked as we get out of this first time suck timeline. 
Good job, soldier. You made it back. Barely. A lot of stuff, right? A lot of stuff. Uh, let, let's talk about first uh, about the Shogun. Uh, Shogun is an extremely popular name for Japanese steakhouse. Uh, it's hard to find an American city in my travel experience that doesn't have at least one Japanese steakhouse with the word Shogun in the title. And a lot of them have Kobe beef on the menu, which if you didn't know already, is, I think, the tastiest uh, food in the whole entire world. But we're not talking about meat in restaurants. We're talking about the ancient and long-lasting system of government in Japan. Uh, the shogun was the new official rank of hereditary military dictator. Uh, shogun is the short form of uh, Sayi uh, Tashogun, uh, meaning commander-in-chief of the expeditionary force against the barbarians. So a little, little long, shortened to shogun. And while Japan would continue to have emperors during the shogunates, uh, their role would be symbolic, uh, similar to the royal of the, uh, or excuse me, the role of the British royal family now. So let's, let's take a, a moment to understand how the shogun, emperor, samurais, uh, daimyaos, uh, everyone else kind of fit into Japan's social hierarchy. This uh, big chunk of history we're talking about. At the top of the social hierarchy would be the emperor. During the shogunate period, the emperor was still at the top of the Japanese social order. Uh, despite the, the change in rule, the, the same uh, family actually would continue to be the emperor uh, this entire time. And actually, it lasts up until this day. Uh, Japan has the longest uninterrupted monarchical, uh, monarchical bloodline in the history of the world. Uh, the early Yamato leaders of Japan claim descent from the sun goddess uh, Amaterasu. Amaterasu, uh, and legend is that it began 2,600 years ago with Emperor Jimu, uh, over 2,600 years ago, who allegedly took power on February 11, 660 BCE. And that continues all the way, this, this bloodline continues all the way to the present. Uh, currently, 84-year-old Emperor uh, Akihito uh, holds the largely symbolic position. He, he was born in the Tokyo Imperial Palace. He's the son of Emperor Hirohito of World War II infamy. And, and during the samurai period of the shogunate, the emperors had a pretty sweet gig, actually. Didn't have to worry about uh, running anything. Didn't have to worry about defending anything. The emperor spent most of his days with ceremonial duties, you know, gen gentlemanly pastimes, which I can only imagine involved a lot of good food, uh, a lot of sex with various court mistresses and or young uh, dudes of the court. Uh, the emperor's movements were restricted, his contacts controlled. He was only permitted to socialize with 140 courtly families that also lived within the imperial precinct. The emperor's life was so secluded that many foreign visitors in Japan were actually unaware of an emperor's existence, while others who were aware of exi his existence believed him to be some type of religious leader or pope. Uh, so unless you were someone who really, really wanted to travel, life is pretty cushy and pretty sweet if you're an emperor or a member of one of those court families. So beneath them... And the real ruler, I mean, technically beneath them, social status-wise, but the real ruler is the shogun, uh, the head samurai, basically. Like, the, the shogun was in charge of the country. He and his appointed administrators ran his feudal military dictatorship. Directly below the shogun uh, and his inner circle of bureaucrats were the daimyao, who ruled the 250 Han clans that made up the country of Japan, all these regional little leaders. Uh, this number would eventually increase to 300 daimyaos. During the Tokugawa period of the shogunate, which lasted from 1603 to 1868, the government owned all of the territory within a day's march of Edo. Uh, the shogun controlled more than a quarter of all cultivated land. He also controlled major communication routes, seaports, uh, precious metal supplies. Uh, before an individual could achieve uh, daimyo status, a feudal warlord, he would have to own or control enough land to produce 10,000 kokus of rice. A koku was considered enough rice to feed an individual for a year. So we talked about those uh, 250 and then 300 daimyaos. Uh, each of them owned enough land to feed 10,000 people. Uh, over 50 of the estates uh, produced more than 100,000 koku. So, and, uh, and the very largest produced an astonishing uh, 1 million koku. So some daimyaos, uh, you know, much more powerful than others. You know, they would rule, you know, over a million people, essentially. More than 5,000 lords uh, also held the title uh, uh, Hatamoto because they produced under 10,000 koku. So there was like, you know, like one notch down beneath the daimyaos, uh, like a like a like a minor, I don't know, like the county commissioner or some shit, <laughs> like the head of a little, um, you know, region within this little uh, province. Uh, the daimyao were controlled by a system of spies. For the most part, they're left alone, but major decisions like the building of roads, forts, and bridges were decided by the shogun, and the spies would make sure that they were loyal to the shogun. Uh, in addition, all marriages had to be approved by the shogun. Uh, the government kept tight, tight control over the daimyao by uh, requiring that the daimyao live in a cap in the capital city. Uh, which during the Tokugawa uh, shogunate was Edo, later to rename Tokyo, part of the year. 
So they were expected to maintain a prestigious home in the capital city and have a home back in their, you know, uh, whatever little region of Japan they lived in. The cost of maintaining two homes and staff for each home, very expensive. Uh, Shogun also required, uh, you know, um, to take specific routes from the, uh, or required the daimyo to, to take specific routes from the estates to the city at specific times. This was to prevent the smuggling of guns and hostages. They were routinely searched for weapons. So that's that. So you got, uh, you know, the emperor, the, the the royal court, you got the shogun, and then the shogun keeps tight control over all these various, like, you know, regional governors, the daimyo, and then there was kind of a little notch below them, which was uh, their own, like, if they had a big, big kind of area of land, they would then divide that further into kind of uh, lesser nobles that would run, you know, each little uh, other areas of farmland. And then next on the social pecking order was the samurai. Uh, the samurai were unconditionally devoted to their shogun, and they were unconditionally devoted also to their daimyo. You know, that's who they kind of like reported directly to. Uh, unsurprisingly, the, the word samurai means one who serves. Samurai warriors were literate, educated, often patrons of the arts. They typically carried a long sword as well as one short sword whose sole purpose was to serve as an instrument of suicide if required. That ritual seppuku suicide. Uh, among samurai, an honorable death was valued above everything. And samurai lived each day prepared to make the ultimate sacrifice. They were far higher on the social scale than commoners. And the slightest insult to a samurai could be a cause for death. It's fucking crazy, man. Samurai lived in castles uh, uh, and towns made up about 5% only of the population, but very important culturally. Next on the social scale were the, the peasant farmers whose rice taxes allowed a samurai and courtly families to live extravagantly. Fucking peasants, man. It's always been a shit job to be a peasant. Uh, the peasants rarely ate the rice they grew, uh, sustained themselves instead on other staples such as barley and and, uh, and other little foods. Tokugawa era farmers were the most advanced farmers in all of Asia, growing cotton, tea, tobacco, sweet potatoes. However, poverty and famine would lead them to revolt at least 2,000 times during the Tokugawa shogunate. So they were uh, they, you know, pretty exploited if they're revolting that often. Uh, and they were also doomed to remain peasants their whole lives without any chance of advancing in society. Uh, you know, unless, unless so you were like a young peasant girl, then you could, um, possibly marry a uh, samurai. And we'll talk about that in a bit. And then, then you, you know, you could further the, the social class, the advancement of the social class of your future generations that way. Uh, next down the pecking order were the artisans who were, uh, you know, not, not terribly well-respected part of society, but, but at least they're above some of the lower classes we'll talk about in a bit, uh, later. So, but, so they were, but they were beneath the peasants. So that's, that's not good. Um, unless they were swordsmiths for high-ranking samurai or, or their pottery happened to please at Daimyo, uh, the artisans were deemed, you know, pretty, pretty useless. They didn't produce food and they paid no rice tax. And so they were not really that valued in society. Man, my, my skills would absolutely render me completely useless in the Japanese shogunate. I would be fucking, I would be beneath a peasant. Pe being a peasant sucked and I'm beneath that. It's unfortunate. Uh, considered even lower than the artisans were merchants. Uh, in the eyes of the courts, they didn't produce shit. Therefore, they were nothing. Uh, in reality, however, the merchants drove economic progress. Uh, they were the entrepreneurs. They provided wood to build new homes and palaces, uh, tatami mats, produce, household items, textiles, trinkets. They built, uh, you know, simple looking homes that adorned themselves with lavish decorations and inner gardens. Merchants rose in wealth, but not status. Uh, they did kind of create their own society within a society that had its own customs, cultures, and inner hierarchy. Uh, but even merchants uh, below them, below even the merchants were jugglers. And banjo players. And worst of all, juggling banjo players, which brings me to today's sponsor. Uh, Time Suck is brought to you once again by Andrew Hole's A-Hole Banjo Academy. Did you know that in addition to learning the fundamentals of air banjoing, like scales, and the basic keys of G, C, D, E, A, H, Z, and the number four, uh, you can also learn how to play traditional Japanese melodies on a banjo. Uh, check out this little ditty. This little ditty is called a Samurai's Meditation on Life's Meaning Next to a Cold Babbling Brook. So there's that. Uh, or uh, what about Tears of the Empress? So there's that. Uh, sign up today and become a real banjo playing a-hole. Uh, get 20% off lessons by using the promo code TIMESUCK at checkout. 
Uh, lessons are guaranteed, 100% guaranteed to drive anyone uh, hanging on to just a fucking threat of their sanity completely over the edge, for sure. Kidding, of course. Time Suck is brought to you today by Eero. Uh, the single router Wi-Fi model just does not work for our increasingly high bandwidth world. What you need is a distributed system, uh, Eero. I've been using it for months, and it has killed all the annoying dead spots in my house where websites won't load, uh, shows won't stream, life turns into a high blood pressure outburst of profanities and pure rage. Whatever your Wi-Fi needs, Eero has the power to seamlessly blanket your home in fast, reliable Wi-Fi via Ethernet, wireless, or any combination. Uh, simply set it on a flat surface or plug it in with a power adapter for increased speed and range with powerful tri-band radios. With the addition of a third uh, 5G radio, the second generation Eero is now tri-band. That's at 5 gigahertz radio, uh, twice as fast as its predecessor. Let's customers do more in every room of their home simultaneously. Meanwhile, Eero Beacon, half the size, but more powerful than the original Eero. Uh, whatever model you choose, the Eero's incredible customer support uh, allows you to get a hold of a Wi-Fi expert within 30 seconds. Now, I didn't have to contact anyone. I had the whole thing set up in less than 10 minutes. Easily, probably closer to five. I downloaded the Eero app, uh, got, got the, the one Eero two beacon system. I unplugged my old cable company Wi-Fi router in the basement, plugged in my Eero hub that has multiple Ethernet ports, then followed the easy Eero instructions as far as uh, where to place my other two beacons around the house for maximum coverage. Put one in Momo's room, put, uh, put one in the kitchen, and now the kids can run their iPads in their bedrooms, kitchen TV streams on Amazon Fire way better than it did before. And what I really like is that I can open the Eero app and I can figure out exactly how much bandwidth is being used on every device. All right, that's very handy. Suddenly, if you have you know trouble uploading a large file, you can open it up, see that one kid is playing Fortnite on PS4, his buddy is playing it via his phone, a third is playing it via an iPad, your daughter is downloading a big file cartoon, and your wife, Lindsay, uh, has left on two computers running stuff in the background. And then you can decide who gets yelled at. Who's going to get yelled at for hogging the internet right now? Now you actually know, right? No false accusations. You have the proof. It's awesome. I feel like I'm living in the future. Uh, so for free overnight shipping in the U.S. or Canada, visit Eero.com. That's E-E-R-O.com. Uh, select overnight as the shipping option. Enter Time Suck at checkout, and you get that free overnight shipping. That's Eero.com. Uh, code Time Suck at checkout. Free overnight shipping. Upgrade your Wi-Fi today. Start surfing away tomorrow. Join the future with Eero. Uh, link in today's episode description and button link in the new and improved Speedy Time Suck app. Okay, now back to the lower tiers of the Shogunate, uh, Shogunate social rankings. The next run rung down is kind of jugglers and banjo players. It's the geisha, actors, and prostitutes. Uh, geisha literally translates to uh, entertainer, and the geisha deserve their own suck. They were Japanese women who entertained men through performing the ancient traditions of art, dance, and singing. Uh, I don't, th I don't think juggling and are just, I don't think air banjo playing uh, are distinctly characterized by, that was a very meek one. See, I didn't want to, I knew you guys would probably be mad about it. Uh, distinctly characterized by their traditional costumes and makeup, the whole kind of like very white face makeup with a very red lips look. And, and of course, uh, uh, actors of other types and prostitutes, they were all deemed entertainers for the nobility and the samurai and therefore not ranked socially very high at all. They lived outside of the hi hierarchy. Actually, I guess they didn't really didn't really have an official rank. But then there was, but they kind of did because there was even one group of people below them. Um, below everyone else in, in Japanese society were the uh, burokumen. Now these these outcasts, uh, this, 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 this term means abundance. <laughs> so fucking messed up. This term means abundance of filth. Uh, there was them and then and also the hinin, uh, hinin uh, the non-humans, my God. Uh, these were like the butchers, tanners, grave diggers, and people who dealt with disease and, and death and the deformed. The origins of these terrible prejudices stem from Shinto and Buddhist, uh, you know, beliefs dictating uh, uh, that were against the killing of animals. Uh, many were, these people were born into their status, although some were demoted there. They were required to live in certain quarters of town where they didn't have to be seen by other people. They abide by curfews. Fucking get in there. Get in there, butcher. The rest of us don't want to look at your fucking disgusting non-human ass. Uh, prejudice continues against this class of people to this day. So as you can see in this hierarchy, the samurai class ranking very, very high. Emperor and his family, you know, 140 families of the imperial court, the shogun and his political administrators, then the demyao, then the samurai. And, you know, and most of the time, all of the members of the classes ranked above the samurai were off in the imperial city. So most of the time, the samurai were the highest rank of, you know, people in whatever little town or countryside they were, they were walking around or living in. 
It was a military feudal society, one largely self-contained to the island of Japan, farmers growing rice, raising livestock to feed everyone else on the island, keep bandits from harassing farmers or taking these crops, to quell uprisings against the daimyos, uh, and occasionally to fight for one clan trying to overtake the shogunate or defend the current shogun from an attempted coup to defend the country itself from the threat of foreign invasion. These were some of the responsibilities of the samurai. Now let's get to know these samurai. Uh, let's start with how they dress. Samurai, when not wearing armor, would dress mainly in cargo shorts, uh, flip-flops, loose-fitting tank tops in order to kind of put off a, a harmless, non-threatening, don't even worry about it, uh, I'm not even going to try and kill you with my sword vibe. They wear a lot of hemp bracelets, make a lot of, a lot of man buns, generally regarded as being super chill, kind of surfer types. Uh, unless you disrespected them or annoyed them, you know, and then they would fucking cut you in half with their, you know, with their sword for giving you like a, for giving them like a funny or odd look. Of course, that's not true. Obviously, their look would evolve and undergo various changes, but samurai traditionally came to be known for wearing a kimono with a short, loose jacket, long shirt-like trousers. Top of their head would be shaved. Uh, it's that a samurai look if you've ever seen it. The hair on the sides and back pulled into a ponytail, oiled and folded over uh, to form a top knot, kind of the precursor to a man bun. Uh, the, the top of the head was shaved because that part of the head got very, very hot and uncomfortable underneath a samurai helmet. I loved learning that because I always wondered, like, I'm like, why do they have that fucking weird-ass haircut? I get such a specific haircut. I'm like, that's a very interesting choice. Uh, very ornate. Looks like a lot of work. Uh, not pleasing to my eye. Um, but it's like, it's so, so specific. I'm like, oh, a lot of it just dictated by the kind of the helmets they wore. So that, I found that very interesting. Before engaging in combat, samurai were expected to be well-groomed. That's part of like how ornate their haircuts were too. Is like, you know, a lot of rituals in their lives. Uh, they had to be like freshly washed and alert, you know, they'd, they'd splash themselves with perfume. They had these daily rituals to make sure they're very clean and smell good and look good. Uh, when they weren't fighting, sometimes they wore an eboshi, uh, which was a hat made from a rigid black cloth. They also wore light and flexible leather armor, heavier armor for samurai. Uh, that's kind of like, you know, that look that's famous today was only worn from the 17th century onwards. Uh, samurai came to belong to specific military houses or, um, or, or bike uh, there were there were no samurai women, although there did exist a small group of female warriors known as the uh, Ona uh, Bugeja, uh, martially skilled women. These women were were members of the samurai class. You know, you could be a member of the samurai class. Women they, they did on, on occasion fight alongside and fought well with male samurais. Uh, traditionally, they were just like to to help guard the home. Like if someone invades the home, someone's you know, then you know it's not just the male samurai defending. It can also be uh, the, the 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 his wife. But then sometimes there are examples of them fighting in battle. This class of warrior actually actually predates the samurai, going back uh, to at least the second century or second century CE, when there were no samurais. But Japanese men were trained to wield swords and spears, and certain women were trained to wield special swords that rested at the end of a long pole, the uh, naganata, and also uh, small daggers and knives. Uh, very much of a warrior a warrior culture. Samurai warriors traveled and waged war primarily on horseback. Primarily, actually fought using bow and arrow, even though you know they're identified by their curved long swords in, in actual battle. Uh, they were great archers and tended to use that more than the sword. They soon began carrying a, a, that second shorter sword, you know, and then a decree by a ruler Hideyoshi in 1588 stated that only samurai could wear two swords. It became an important status symbol. Most lived austere lives of brutal training and conditioning. Training methods for individual samurai varied as much as the samurai themselves, but it always usually resolved, yeah, revolved around a strict code of honor, which came to be known as Bushido. A chief concern of the Bushido code was of uh, duty. Duty to family, employer, fellow warriors. Uh, second concern was that of preparation for death. Samurai were instructed to live as though they expected to die in the next minute, thus ensuring their present behavior left no room for, for regret. Samurai were encouraged to meditate frequently on these principles, preparing themselves for the rigors of service and war. An entire suck could be devoted to understanding uh, Bushido and, uh, and the dress of the samurai, the code, uh, 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 or excuse me, and like the dress of the samurai, the, the code evolved. But for today, here's a simplified version of the eight main tenets of Bushido. Uh, number one is rectitude, uh, correct judgment or procedure for the resolution of righteousness, to die when it is right to die, to strike when it is right to strike. Number two is courage, a virtue uh, only in the cause of righteousness. Death for an unworthy cause was termed a dog's death. It is true courage to live when it is right to live and to die only when it is right to die. Number three is fury. When displaying courage in battle or in the rectifying of dishonor, fight with fury. Do not merely strike the head, cut it furiously in two. Do not merely strike the body, furiously empty it of its organs. 
Do not strike down only who attacks you. Erase their family from the records. Let the blood of babies flow with that of men. And then uh, quite a left turn here, benevolence. Uh, benevolence uh, is love, affection for others. This is number four. Sympathy and nobility of feeling uh, are regarded as the highest attributes of the soul. Saying benevolence brings under its sway whatever hinder its power, just as water subdues fire. Number five is politeness. I like that. I like that. Uh, a poor virtue, if it is actuated only by a fear of offending good taste. Rather, it should stem from a sympathetic regard for the feeling of others. In its highest form, politeness approaches love. That's very cool, man. I love the way they write that. Right? Don't don't do it just because you're not you're trying not to piss somebody else off. Do it because it's the right thing to do. Uh, six, veracity, truthfulness. Lying was deemed cowardly, and it was regarded as dishonorable. Indeed, the word of a samurai guaranteed the truthfulness of an assertion. No oath is necessary. Propriety carried beyond bounds becomes a lie. Uh, number seven, honor. A vivid consciousness of personal dignity and worth is implicit in the word honor. Dishonor is like a scar on a tree, which time, instead of effacing, only helps to enlarge. That's fucking cool, too, man. These guys, these guys knew how to write some cool shit. Think about that. Dishonor is like a scar on a tree, which time, instead of effacing, only helps to enlarge. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but it's like, you ever seen a tree when somebody like carved their initials into it like many years ago and it just grows bigger and bigger and bigger? That's, oh, that's beautiful writing. Number eight, loyalty. Only in the code of chivalrous honor does loyalty assume importance. In the conflict between loyalty and affection, the code never wavers from the choice of loyalty. A samurai was obliged to appeal to the intelligence and conscience of his sovereign by demonstrating the sincerity of his words with shedding of his own blood. Oh, and I almost uh, forgot. Uh, I made the fury tenant up. The fury is that's that's not true. That that is uh, that's not true. There was the the other the other seven is true, but the, the, the <laughs> fury is not a thing. They're not they're not trying to uh, they're not trying to you know advocate baby killing that I'm aware of. Okay. Also, let's talk about Shintoism now. I talked about I mentioned it earlier. Uh, it was Shintoism that gave the samurai their strong belief in the importance of tradition and the will to fight for their homeland. While Buddhism would strengthen and wane throughout the samurai era, Shintoism would remain constant. Uh, Shintoism is the ancient native religious traditions of Japan practiced in a highly ritualistic setting. Uh, it, it essentially is the worship of one's ancestors and homeland, and being that Japan was mostly closed off from the rest of the world during the samurai period, it was basically just the worship of Japan. Uh, the essence of Shinto uh, is the Japanese devotion to invisible spiritual beings and powers called uh, kami, uh, to shrines and to various rituals. The shrine takes the place of a traditional church, although some shrines uh, are giant temples complete with Shinto priests. Uh, but you can also have like a little shrine just right in your house uh, or out in your garden. Shinto is, is not a way of explaining the world. Or what matters are rituals that enable human beings to communicate with the kami. Uh, the, the best English tr tr translation of kami is uh, spirits, but this is an oversimplification of a complex concept, which I feel like this whole suck is. It's, uh, Japanese culture is just very complex. Uh, kami uh, can be elements of the landscape or forces of nature. Kami are close to human beings, respond to human prayers. They can influence the course of natural forces, human events. Shinto tradition says that there are 8 million uh, kami in Japan. Kami is in everything and is found everywhere. It's what makes an object itself uh, rather than something else. The word kami means that which is hidden. Not all kami are good. Uh, some are thoroughly evil. Some are powerful like uh, Amat Amaterasu, uh, the sun goddess. Or Hachiman, the, the god of archery and war. Some are less impressive, like uh, uh, Otusun, the god of biscuits. And uh, Mikilan, the goddess of raisins. And then, of course, there is Bojangles, god of honor, and, of course, Pitbulls. Okay. Now, I made up the biscuit and raisin gods, but maybe, maybe. I mean, they might exist. I mean, you know, there's, a, there's 8 million of them. Uh, Shintoism is still a big religion, by the way, with a, a little over 100 million followers, the vast majority of whom live in Japan, where almost 80% of the population still practices at least some form of Shinto tradition, uh, Shintoism ranks as the world's fifth largest religion. Um, there is a loose concept of an afterlife with Shintoism because there's a belief that the ancestral spirits will protect their descendants. So, you know, you go somewhere. Also important to samurai Shintoism, uh, a view that some individuals who live an exemplary life uh, can become deified and uh, go into the Shinto version of heaven, you know, in this process of uh, ap apotheosis. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, many in the imperial family have experienced this honor as have successful warriors. So a strong emphasis on tradition, honor, and loyalty to one's people and country, uh, those themes would define much of the life of the samurai. Now that I finally kind of gave a, a brief overview to Shintoism, let's talk about this uh, physical conditioning of the samurai. 
Samurai condition themselves and prove their physical toughness by battling with the elements. Practices such as standing nude in deep snow or sitting beneath ice cold waterfalls, two common examples of samurai training practices. Um, many also would practice voluntarily going without food, water, or sleep to harden themselves against deprivation. On the other extreme, heavy drinking was a favorite pastime to, to build endurance, to increase vigor. I mean, these guys are like, it's like the stereotypical definition of a man's man. Just uh, pounding sake, then going literally balls deep in a snowbank. And, and that after a long day of sword training, maybe some cutting some fools down. Uh, many samurai trained in, in, in unarmed combat skills as well, most commonly in uh, bujutsu, uh, the style that eventually spawned karate, judo, and aikido. Because warriors always went with that, uh, about, excuse me, warriors always went about armed. Uh, it was rarely practiced with the expectation of, of realistically using these martial arts to fight. Instead, samurai studied unarmed fighting to condition themselves physically and just to better understand armed combat. Uh, they also used the kata, formal practice exercises as a meditative practice. I mean, these guys are like modern day special forces warriors who just, you know, uh, never had to bother with paperwork or learn how to use computer. They just had lives completely devoted to the preparation for battle. Uh, when it came to weapons training, samurai traditionally uh, trained with a sword, a uh, bow, and a spear-like weapon called uh, uh, naganata. During the peak of the feudal period, famed instructors in these arts opened up schools under the protection of a single lord, Daimyao, who would encourage a samurai to train there. While training, samurai would uh, use wooden weapons for practice against each other, then sharp swords against dummies made of wood or straw. Occasionally, you'll find this on the web, <laughs> samurai also would practice their weapon techniques against live people. Uh, like like slaves or prisoners. They just chop them down. That would suck for those people. Uh, like some prisoner had been sentenced to death. It's like, no, nah, yeah, we don't need a dummy. Just uh, just take him out. Samurai had time for all this shit because of uh, outside of fighting, they didn't they didn't have to work. Their position entitled them to a yearly stipend of rice, which uh, you know was often more than they needed, and they would sell some of it for cash or other goods. Uh, all that was required of them was that they had to be ready to fight and fight when called upon, even if that never actually happened in a major way. They were also kind of like a police force, so sometimes they would settle like little disputes as well. Uh, but some samurai would go their whole lives without ever seeing, you know, true, you know, like uh, warlike combat. Uh, some worked other jobs to supplement their income. Farmers would give as much as 60% of their rice uh, to the samurai class. Artisans often uh, sold their crates to samurai, some of whom uh, would become artisans themselves for kind of like a side job, I guess. Samurai patronized the arts and engaged in salon-style gatherings hosted by Daimyao. They supported painters, poets, playwrights, and uh, again, often became creators themselves. They arranged flowers, wrote calligraphy, played Go, uh, which is an ancient strategy board game invented in China over 2,500 years ago. Still played today. Uh, they acted in no dramas. You know, the tea ceremony was one of their most cherished cultural pursuits. A description of General uh, Kanemori uh, uh, Yonishi went, he defended the castle of Kishiwara and personally took 208 heads. So he took 208 heads in battle, and he was also a noted tea master. I love that those are the two things that, you know, people cared about him being good at. You know, but man, this tea is delicious, General uh, Kanemori. Uh, I'm impressed. Do you, do you have any other talents I don't know about? Uh, I'm exceptionally talented at cutting people's heads off. Huh, that's terrifying. Uh, I was hoping to hear you say barbecue and ribs or maybe some wood carving. Uh, commoners were expected to show respect towards samurai at all times. The penalty uh, for disrespect, fairly severe. If a peasant somehow disrespected a samurai, failing to obey an order, for example, accidentally touched his sword, the offended samurai had the right to kill that person on the spot. Now, this rarely happened, but it did happen. Man, how fucking tense would your life be if you knew that if you just rubbed a local samurai the wrong way, uh, they could kill you? Like, you know, we all have somebody uh, that we irritate. Or we have someone who you know irritates us just by being who they are. Maybe the way they chew food, uh, the sound they make when they breathe, just you know, fill us with rage. What if you had like basically carte blanche to kill people like that? I feel like my daimyo uh, would have to bring me in for a lot of talks. You know, just uh, yes, my lord, have I done something wrong? Well, nothing technically wrong. It's just you've just been <sighs> look. You've been killing a lot of peasants lately, and several musicians, and a few actors, and frankly, too many shopkeepers to count. They disrespected me, my lord. <sighs> Define disrespect, Samurai Cummins. Well, they, they looked at me funny. Or they refused to look at me. Or you know what? Or sometimes uh, they chew with their mouth open. Or, oh man, this one fucking gets me. They slurped their soup. Or burp and didn't excuse themselves. Or farted. Or might have farted. You know, uh, in, in a way that, you know, it had to have been someone in the area, and probably them. Or played music way too loud when I was trying to talk to somebody else. 
or oh god this one or, or had a laugh that sounded like a, a cat being beaten it's just rawr, just really rage inducing laugh then i think you have disrespect confused with irritation oh shit you're right all right okay cool i'm gonna work on that uh and how terrible would it be to lose a family member that way like can you imagine you grow up without a father because he was clumsy maybe he accidentally bumped into a fucking samurai at the market and touched his sword <laughs> Oh my God. Well, the samurai uh, in various periods uh, really did get away with some crazy shit, man. During that tumultuous age of warring states that lasted from 1467 to 1568, when all the various daimyos were essentially just regional leaders of autonomous states and, and, and battle between them was nearly constant. This was the most, uh, you know, high concentration of battle kind of period of being a samurai. This informal practice developed among samurai known as uh, Toshugiri, which roughly translates to crossroads killing. <laughs> and what it was was um, some samurai who, you know, they just purchased a new weapon. They just mastered some new technique. Uh, they would just kind of walk around at night and they would want to practice their new technique or, or try out their new sword on just whoever the fuck happened to walk around, you know, by them. And now these wanton acts of, you know, just night stabbings were technically illegal, but very, very few samurai were ever arrested for doing it because it was, it was really hard to arrest someone for a crime that involves killing the only witness and then just leaving. And, you know, being part of a class where you were allowed to kill people. <laughs> My God, man. So that, that whole, like, live an honorable life, you know, that whole Bushido code, yeah, it did take a backseat to other interests in moments. Uh, marriage in the age of samurai was an unusual thing because uh, what exactly it entailed depended on the class of the woman, uh, you know, um, who were marrying the samurai. When women from the lower classes wanted to get themselves some of that sweet samurai D, uh, they had to pay pay them for the privilege of becoming what amounted to basically being a servant. That was the cost of jumping up in class. That was what it took to get, you know, your offspring uh, up a little higher in the rankings. One of the most valued traits in samurai wives was obedience, and they were basically expected to do everything for their husband, including making themselves available for sex 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, which would not be as insulting for these women if their husbands weren't also allowed to have mistresses and as many as they wanted whenever they wanted. Uh, wives were also expected to kill themselves <laughs> if their husband messed up which would have to be such an unfortunate way to die. You know, like now if your partner really fucks up and throws, a, you know, like your retirement money or retirement money into some guy pyramid scheme or, or gets arrested for having an affair with some underage babysitter, you know, you get a divorce, you're ashamed. Back then you fucking killed yourself. So that's a positive way to think about modern divorce, I guess. Uh, seppuku, that Japanese ritual suicide we described in detail in the uh, um, suicide forest suck was practiced by samurai when they really messed up. Usually it was done uh, as a way to rob an enemy of the satisfaction of killing them. Uh, you know, so to commit su seppuku, a samurai would uh, would slice open his own stomach with a small blade. You know, that the, the smaller of the two swords he carried before his head was ceremonially uh, cut off by a trusted associate in order to minimize their suffering. And they, you know, they, they chose the stomach because that's what they thought kind of like the soul resided. They wanted to show how clean their soul was. Uh, when a samurai screwed up so badly, though. He felt that he needed to commit seppuku to die with at least a shred of honor intact, yet his wife also expected to kill herself. What a bummer. Um, no one took the concept of death before honor just or dishonor quite as seriously as the medieval samurai. One more interesting note about samurais before we jump into the next timeline, which is, involves the life of a specific samurai. Uh, samurai training young boys in the ways of combat were allowed to take these apprentices as their lover until they became an adult, part of what was called a brotherhood contract which was uh, a lot less about brotherhood and mostly about boy fucking uh sex between the couple was expected to end when the boy came of age uh the relationship would ideally develop uh, into a lifelong bond of friendship at that point that's fucking so weird to me what a weird transition that would be just this whole plutonic friendship after kid sex right very strange to have drinks years later everyone's married to women now and, you know you just man we had some good times right man god yeah Thanks for teaching me the code, man. Thanks for teaching me uh, really how to use a sword. God, thanks for thanks for teaching me to master my emotions. And and you know what? I just want to say, just, I'll take this moment. Most of all, thanks for the lube. Truly, thanks for always really lubing up uh, and lubing up hard. You know, when you when you push me down and gave me that that deep, uh, you know, grown up dick. I just I appreciate it. I know you didn't have to do that, and it, I just want to know. I just want you to know it didn't go unnoticed. Uh, it's fucking it's crazy, man. I'm constantly amazed by what has been determined to be culturally normal human behavior at various points in history. You know, last week's Children of God cult founder David Burke would have loved this aspect of samurai lifestyle. Why Why all the kid fucking in history? I don't... Well, while this went on, sexual activity with women uh, was not barred for either party. And then once a boy came of age, you know, both were free to seek more underage lovers and just continue this cycle. 
Uh, it is noted that the samurai can only do this with a boy's express permission, but anyone with a basic understanding of how consent works knows that uh, it, it doesn't work when one of the one of the partners is a kid who doesn't understand their rights yet. Uh, oh, actually, and I, I do have, uh, I said that was the last thing, but there's two more, the ronin and the kabukomono. Can't, can't give a samurai overview without bringing up the ronin. The idea of ronin, the masterless samurai who became wandering swords for hire, uh, become highly romanticized in modern culture. How did one become a ronin? Well, if a samurai lost his master, otherwise dishonored himself, decided that he didn't want to commit seppuku uh, and carve out his own intestines, he could uh, become a ronin, which was roughly an uh, anagalist, uh, anagalist. God dang it, I can't say that word right now. There's too many words. There's too many fucking hard words. Word difficulty in this suck, fucking code red, uh, which was the same as being a hobo who's basically really good at fighting. Like a, a good fighting hobo was the ronin. Despite being considered one of the lowest rungs of society, ronin still got to act like samurai. Uh, they still refused to work regular jobs. Uh, consider it beneath them. Usually worked as like bodyguards, mercenaries, straight up criminals. Uh, they'd earn their keep usually by killing or robbing people for money. Uh, like ronin, uh, Kabu Komono uh, were a master of sam samurai who decided that being alive was preferable alternative to letting someone cut their head off with a sword. Unlike Ronan, though, they celebrated their new lease on life by just being fabulous. Uh, the Kabu Kimono would dress in wildly flamboyant outfits, the most garish colors possible. When such an outfit couldn't be found, the Kabu Kimono would settle for women's clothing, accentuated with the most uh, ridiculous-looking haircut possible, uh, making them very similar to hipsters, uh, just marginally less annoying. Uh, Kabu Kimono is samurai with no masters and thus no responsibilities, spent most of their time just actively making the world a terrible place, uh, engaging in activities like beating random people, to death in the street, fleeing from restaurants without pain, uh, murdering people for fun, looking for other uh, kabukomono to fight. Uh, okay. All right. There's this very strange aspect of samurai life out of the way. To further explore the life of a samurai warrior, let's examine the life of one samurai in particular, perhaps the most famous samurai, uh, Miyamoto Musashi, uh, in today's second Time Suck timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. In 1584, Miyamoto Musashi uh, is born into a samurai family in the village called uh, Miyamoto Village in the Harima province. That's where he got his name. His full name was uh, either Shinmen Musashi or Kami Fujiwara no Genshin. Uh, he'd later adopt the name of his birthplace. I want you to know I fucking nailed that second one, by the way. Uh, maybe I should have done that. Maybe Riggins Cummins would be a stronger sound than Dan. Although the consecutive ends is a bit strange. Maybe uh, Riggs Cummins or maybe maybe Rig Cum. Rig, I don't, probably not. Uh, Musashi's father, samurai named uh, Shinmen Munsai, an accomplished expert in uh, Kenjutsu, which is uh, swordsmanship, and in uh, Jujutsu, the art of using a jit or jute, a small kind of non-bladed weapon, sometimes wooden with a hook on the end. Weapon used primarily for non-lethal attacks that has become a, a symbol of, or became a symbol of the Japanese uh, palatial guard since actual blades were forbidden to be brought inside the shogun's palace and one of the few places on the island where you weren't supposed to bring your sword uh, Munsai taught uh, Kenjutsu Jujutsu to Masashi at a young age as a tradition in uh, samurai families samurais began training almost literally as soon as they could walk given rudimentary fighting lessons uh, as young as three years old and the young Musashi showed uh, early talent with a sword uh, Musashi's mother died shortly after his birth and initially he's raised primarily by a stepmom named uh, Toshiko who history knows very little about. In 1591, when his father divorced Toshiko, seven-year-old Musashi taken and raised by a Buddhist uncle, a monk from the Shorian Temple. Uh, while staying with this monk, he was taught Zen Buddhism and basic skills such as reading and writing. For the next few years, Musashi did see his father, who was said to be a harsh, strict, and demanding man, especially towards his son. Which I guess that's the kind of dad you need to become a badass samurai. This, this relationship was tumultuous. Munsai showed no love for the young Musashi. Uh, when Musashi was uh, around nine or ten, his father either died or completely abandoned the boy. It's thought, it's thought that he died. It's thought that he died at the hands of uh, one of Musashi's later adversaries. Hard to say since Musashi didn't really write about his parents. Some historians say that uh, Shinmen Munsai was killed during a duel with a swordsman named uh, Ganryu uh, Yoshitaka. In 1596, 13-year-old Musashi has his first duel, right, like kids would do, I guess, back then. Man, at 13, with Arima uh, Kihai, a samurai from the Tajimi province, or Tajima province. Seconds after the beginning of the fight, Musashi threw Arima to the ground and then hit him with his uh, bokuro, this wooden training sword, uh, also known as a boken, and he hit him hard enough to kill him. Uh, Arima would die vomiting blood. And, and quick word on duels, man. They could, they could be fought for a variety of reasons under a variety of circumstances in Japan. Uh, reminds me of kind of like Wild West gunfights in America, 18th century, 
uh, 19th century duels where, you know, two dudes would do the whole walk 20 or so paces and then turn around and fire thing. You know, some of the former presidents like, uh, what Andrew Jackson, I think got some duels, uh, you know, Doc Holliday, that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, they were, they were, they were usually fought to, um, to uh, settle some type of dispute, right? Some perceived wrong. Uh, they could also just be fought to prove that someone was a better warrior. Uh, there'd be non-lethal duels, you know, they could be fought with non-lethal weapons such as the Bulkin, uh, which obviously, as the last example proved, still could produce lethal blows. Um, and that was just, you know, uh, just to prove kind of one's mastery of the weapon or prove that one's samurai school was superior to another one. Uh, similar to non-lethal duels, there was these duels where you know it's going to be a fight to the death. Uh, they were fought to show mastery of one's weapon, to avenge the loss of a member of your clan or your family, to uh, recover some honor, or, for any number of reasons. And there were also battlefield duels where two different samurai armies would face off in battle. And then before fighting, uh, each send over a single troop to fight each other to the death as, uh, you know, could be a, for like a morale booster for the team. Or if agreed upon beforehand, a duel could actually uh, take the place of actual battle. And, you know, in some circumstances during these duels, it was not uncommon for each samurai to boast of their skills and and past victories before facing off. Uh, the first Musashi duel was in theory a non-lethal duel uh, because Musashi, you know, thought he was a better swordsman than Arima. Turned out he was right. Uh, Musashi uh, wanted to be known as Japan's greatest swordsman. And the only way to do that was to fight other noted swordsmen. Uh, can you can you imagine, by the way, fighting a grown up in a sword duel? With a wooden sword or otherwise, when you're only 13 years old, that's seventh, eighth grade age. I mean, I mean, there were a fair amount of fifth and sixth graders that could have whooped my ass when I was in seventh and eighth grade. Probably a few spunky fourth graders, you know, maybe even a rarely or a rare, highly trained third grader that could have gotten the job done. I just, I can't even imagine uh, doing that. I can't think of any high school juniors or seniors I could have stomped when I was in junior high. Definitely no grown ass men, unless they were like paralyzed or blind or, or attached to an iron lung or asleep uh, over the age of 90, you know, not looking, that kind of thing. Uh, but I also didn't start training to be a hand-to-hand -hand combatant when I was a toddler. I wasn't groomed my entire childhood to be a premier soldier. God, it reminds me of Greeks' ancient Spartans, man, trained from almost birth to fight. Uh, in 1599, 16-year-old Musashi leaves the monastery and duels and kills a swordsman named uh, Tadashimi Akiyama. Uh, very little is known about this samurai other than he got his ass whooped by Musashi. In 1600, there was a possibility that the 16-year-old samurai fought in the Battle of Sekigahara, on the side of the Ashika, uh, Ashikaga clan uh, against the victorious army of uh, Tokugawa. Uh, despite being on the losing side, he fought bravely, um, according to some historians, and somehow managed to survive both the battle and the ensuing massacre of the uh, Ashikaga troops that followed it. The aftermath of the Battle of uh, Sekigahara uh, left Miyamoto uh, Musashi in the position of being a masterless samurai, the Ronin. He began to wander Japan on a type of warrior pilgrimage known as a Musha Shugio. Uh, uh, or warrior's quest. Uh, during these years, he would travel the land and hone his fighting skills and philosophy through a series of duels, many of which were to the death. Supposedly, he fought in 61 duels and won them all. He was a Floyd Mayweather of Samurai, minus the super obnoxious Money Mayweather Instagram account. Uh, Musashi fought three famous duels in 1604 against the unfortunate Yoshi, uh, Yoshiaka clan. Oh, these poor guys. Mushi, Mushi, uh, Musashi uh, first challenged uh, Yoshioko uh, Sechuro, master of the Yoshiaka school and head of this family. This is the guy who teaches the samurais at the school how to fight with swords. And uh, Musashi's like, yeah, that's cute. That's cute you think you know how to teach warriors how to fight, but I bet I'd fucking destroy you one-on-one, -on -one, bro. Uh, Sejuro eagerly accepts a duel, and then both men decide to fight outside of the uh, Rendashi temple in northern Kyoto, March 8, 1604. Musashi, uh, famous for getting into the minds of his opponents. He was like the Michael Jordan of uh, samurai. He's like a master-level shit talker, psychological manipulator. He intentionally arrives late on the day of the fight in order to insult his opponent's honor, and it works. Uh, Sejuro loses his temper, judging uh, Musashi's behavior to be very unacceptable, as they previously agreed the duel was to be fought with the wooden training sword again, the Bukoto, and the winner would be declared uh, whoever lands the first, uh, you know, unblocked blow. Well, they face off, they take the on-guard position, and basically instantaneously, Musashi hits uh, Sejuro's sh uh, shoulder with his wooden sword, knocking him off his feet and breaking his left arm. Hits it pretty hard. And he wins a duel. And Sejuro, uh, so tormented by the dishonor of losing, excuse me, that uh, he pretty much immediately retires from the warrior's life and would later become a monk in the Zen order. That's impressive. When you beat somebody right out of their class, like he beat him out of the samurai class. That's when you really know you've whooped somebody. When you when you beat them into a new, <laughs> into a new career. Like if you like if you went up against some middleweight champ in the octagon 
and you beat the shit out of him so badly that the next week he's just working as a produce manager. Like, dude, what's up, man? Why aren't you, why aren't you fighting? Oh, no, 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 I'm done. I'm done after last week. I just want to water these grapes now. I just want to, I just want to, you know, I can't think about fighting. I just got to think about these grapes. You know, it makes me, it makes me start to get like tight in the chest. You know, I got to focus on stacking these rusted potatoes now. I got to make sure these beats aren't going bad. You know what I'm saying? I got to, I got to have some, I got to actually have somebody else check the beats. I can't even handle being around something called beats right now. You know what I mean? Uh, Shijiro's brother, a brilliant swordsman named uh, Yoshiaka uh, Denshi Chiro, then becomes the head of the Yoshiaka family and challenges Musashi to, uh, to another duel to regain his family's honor, avenge his brother's defeat. This is like some fucking kung fu movie shit. I love it, man. He beats one brother. Another brother's like, no, 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 uh-uh. uh, now I have to fight you. We can't let this go unchecked. So the second duel is now they, they, they up the ante. This is a fight to the death. Straight up duel to the death. Uh, even though it was a death match, uh, Musashi, not armed with a steel sword, he chooses a Bokutu, that wooden training sword again. He's pretty fucking lethal with that thing. Denji uh, Chiro uh, has a staff reinforced with steel rings. Now, I'm not sure uh, I'm not sure if that wooden sword choice is actually part of some tradition or like dual rules or just Musashi showing off. Uh, sure, bro. We can, yeah, we can fight to the death. No, 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 you get what you want. You want some steel on your weapon? I don't, yeah, fine. I'm just going to get a wooden sword. That's all I need to beat your chump ass. Uh, Musashi, mentally, technically, physically stronger than his skilled opponent, seconds after the beginning of the duel, uh, hits a Denshi Chiro uh, with his wooden sword, kills him instantly with a single blow to the head. God dang, man. That's got to be a real fucking rough moment for the Yoshiaka clan. You know, whether or not it was socially acceptable or allowed under their honor code to show excitement before the match, like, I feel like it was probably quiet, but you know, they felt it inside. Like, you ever watch a boxing or MMA match? Man, shit is hyped right before the fight begins. That's when both fighters, you know, uh, you know, fans are trying to pump their warrior up. You know, people cheering, you got this, man. You got this, Denji Chiro. Man, fuck him up, bro. He got lucky, man. He's a punk. Mushashi ain't shit. You got this. He ain't shit. You're the champ, bro. You know, <laughs> And then the worst is when it's almost an immediate loss for someone's fans. Because it's just such a quick emotional shift from like, you got this, bro, man. You fuck. Oh, oh no. Oh, why he killed him? Man, he killed him so fast. Especially with a wooden sword, man. Just bop, bop someone in the head dead. Uh, probably more than a bop. Uh, the Oshiaka clan, now they're desperate. They've lost two. You know, uh, this is, now they've lost two heads of the family. This son of a bitch. So now the next head of the clan uh, is poor 12-year-old, uh, Yoshiaka uh, Mata Achiro, uh, who, like his predecessors, also challenges Musashi to a duel, which I feel like he shouldn't have been allowed to get away with. Like in the movie version, you know, the 12-year-old yells, I'll, I'll kill you, I'll kill you, Musashi. But then he's dragged away by older, more sensible family members who are like, we fucking, okay, please just leave now. Please, you've brought uh, shame into our family forever. You've killed our two leaders. Just, God, please, just, just leave so you don't have to at least watch us suffer in shame. But in real life, uh, this happens, and Musashi doesn't back down. You know, he's like, he used to fight when he was 13, so he's like, okay, fucking, you want to go, 12-year-old? We're going to go. Uh, this time, the Yoshiaka clan decides the duel between uh, these two uh, is going to be fought at night between the 12-year-old and Musashi. Uh, unusual for nighttime duels to be requested, so Musashi gets suspicious. He's like, something's up this time. And he decides to r- arrive at the rendezvous point well before the time of the fight, this time instead of way late. And he waits and he hides for his enemy to come. The boy arrives dressed in full armor with a party of well-armed retainers, archers, swordsmen, and uh, and this being a few decades after the introduction of the muskets, even some riflemen who are all determined to kill Musashi. Like they're they're not going to let it be a fair fight, right? Uh, they're all they're all like uh, hiding nearby. This is a trap, and uh, Machi Shishiro is the is the bait. Well, Musashi watches the action. This this seems like a legend, but this is what it says. He waits patiently, concealed in the bushes. When the moment's right, he fucking springs out draws his sword, and cuts that fucking kid's head off. Cuts a 12-year-old's head off. Seconds later, uh, his, the, the, the men are gathered around Musashi, trying to stop him from escaping. He outnumbered. He, he, now, he takes both swords in his hand. He's got the suicide sword and the regular sword. He cuts a path through rice fields surrounding them, making his way to escape while being attacked by dozens of men. He starts fighting with both swords, you know, and, 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 uh, and he just uh, annihilates, you know, a number of other of the, uh, of the, the clan's, you know, warriors. Now, not sure uh, how he escaped being shot, if he actually was surrounded by riflemen. But uh, what, this maybe this story is a mix of facts and legend. I don't know. Maybe he really was like, you know, fucking crouching tiger, hidden dragon kind of good. Uh, many historians agree that Musashi discovered the superiority of wielding two swords during this battle. The use of two swords simultaneously, totally foreign to the conventions of Kenjutsu sword training. Uh, samurai tradition only fought with a long sword, you know, held in two hands. But his experience forged the path to what would become known as the uh, Nitu Ryu style of Kenjutsu. Pretty dope, man. Created that badass style of sword fighting that many years later would, would hit the big screen. 
Shortly after his series of duels with this clan, uh, in 1605, he goes to the uh, Hoisan Temple in the south of Kyoto, where he has a series of non-lethal contests with the monks. He's fighting fucking monks now, showing them how to showing them how to fight. These, these monks, renowned for being masters of the spear, but they couldn't beat him. Even today, the monks of Hoisan uh, still train in, in their renowned traditional spear technique. While on his way to Edo, in autumn of 1607, Miyamoto Musashi uh, has a duel with uh, Shishiro Baiken, a skilled swordsman who is the master of the uh, Kusaragama. This is a sickle with a chain and a weight attached to one end. It's a fucking crazy, intimidating-looking weapon. Like, when, when, if you were to see somebody swinging this weird chain ball sickle type thing, you would know immediately that they're a psychopath. Like, it's not the weapon of choice for someone with any kind of stability whatsoever. Uh, well, this biking wants to end Mushashi's re reputation as an invincible duel uh, duelist, uh, and instead, uh, he gets killed. Musashi strikes him dead. And then his bike in uh, falls to the floor. So, uh, supposedly his pupils begin to attack Musashi, who then fucking fights him off with his two-sword technique. Dude doesn't even seem real to me. Seems like a sword-slinging boogeyman. You just make up to scare, you know, kids. Eat your vegetables or Musashi's going to come over here and kick the door down. Cut your head off. Uh, later that year, Musu Gonosuku, uh, famous and arrogant swordsman, challenges Musashi to a duel. Uh, Gonosuke, I guess it's Gonosuke, uh, was a master of the martial art of Shinto uh, Musurayo which uh, uses a short staff. It was claimed that Gonosuke had never lost a duel and had defeated Japan's finest swordsman. Well, historians say that Musashi's father had maybe even previously fought this guy and lost. Well, both Musashi and his opponent agreed to fight with wooden swords. Uh, Gonosuke quickly disabled with a single blow from Musashi's uh, Bokuro. Man, he was, no one, no one could touch this guy with a wooden sword. Strongly affected by his defeat, Gonosuke withdraws to a Shinto monastery where he contemplates his defeat and then train specifically to fight Musashi again. He wants to develop new techniques that allow him to beat this guy. <laughs> again, this guy doesn't seem real. Musashi uh, and Gunosuke, uh, they duel again sometime later. And even though Gonosuke uh, uses his newly developed uh, sword fighting techniques, still gets beat. Beat uh, this man. Beat this dude into a monastery where the guy devotes his life, fucking D David Carradine Kung Fu style, to just, you know, to, <laughs> to getting better and fighting this guy. And then, and then he gets beat again. I wonder if he goes back to the monastery after the second defeat. Just shoulders really slumped low that time. Hey, guys. <sighs> yeah. No, Musashi. Um, whoop me again. Do you guys just need anyone to, cl to like clean the toilets or anything? I'm, I'm done. I'm done training now. Uh, shortly after this fight, Musashi about to encounter his greatest and most skilled opponent, Sasaki Kojiro, a.k.a. Scorpion, whose finishing move was either have uh, uh, his head turn into a skull and then he'd breathe fire on you and rip out your spine and rip your fucking out of your body. No, wait, that's uh, that's uh, that's from Mortal Kombat. Uh, no, uh, Sasaki uh, developed a very effective uh, Kenjutsu style based on the movement of a swallow's tail in flight. Uh, for real, that's what it says. Uh, Sasaki fought with a no dachi, which was a very long two-handed sword. Uh, despite the sword's length and weight, Kojiro strikes with the weapon, unusually quick and precise. Will these two great swordsmen agree to fight? The duel takes place on April 13, 1612 on uh, Kanrayo Island, located off the coast of the Bison province. Duel set for the early morning. On the day of the fight, uh, Sasaki Kojiro and the officials serving as witness waited for Musashi for hours. He's done it again. He's fucking with him. His absence leads uh, to the rumor that he's run away in fear for his life because he was so terrified of Kojiro's technique. Nope. Nope, just more psychological warfare. Uh, Miyamoto uh, Musashi transported to uh, Kan Kanrayo Island on boat by a local fisherman. And as part of his strategy, uh, you know, arriving late for the duel once again uh, to disturb his opponent's inner state. And then legend has it that <laughs> during this short trip, he sculpts a sword for the battle. <sighs> I mean, this is what it says. I have a hard time believing this. I like, get the fuck out of here. I mean, this is what the legend said, but that's like some Chuck Norris shit. You know, Musashi doesn't need to bring a sword to a fight. He just whittles his own. But supposedly, he didn't. Supposedly, he fucking whittles himself a sword on the, on the boat. Uh, arrives, and Saki and the officials, they're, they're irritated. They've been waiting forever. Uh, you know, Sasaki, blinded by rage, draws his katana, throws away his scabbard, to which Masashi uh, apparently sees and says, if you have no more use for your sheath, you are already dead. Talking some shit, talking some samurai shit talk. The duel begins, like the earlier fights, it's over quickly. Musashi uh, provokes Kojiro into making the first attack then counters with a blow strong enough to break Kijoro's left ribs hard enough to puncture his lungs and kill him. Puncture his lungs, excuse me, and kill him, yeah. Before running back to his boat, Musashi bows to his downed opponent and then apparently he realizes with sadness that one of the greatest swordsmen to ever live has just died at his hand. 
And it was at this point that Musashi attained a satori, or spiritual awakening. From this moment, he renounced lethal duels. Yeah, satori uh, roughly translates into individual enlightenment, a flash of sudden awareness. <clears throat> Excuse me, in 1614 and 1615, a war erupts between the uh, Toyotomi and uh, Tokugawa families. So even though he wasn't going to fight in lethal duels, he's still got to fight in some wars. Uh, Musashi takes place in the warfare, sieges, uh, you know, one last time. He participates in, in, the, in the, both the winter and summer battles in Osaka. Most scholars believe that, in the, as in the previous war, Musashi fought on uh, Toyotomi uh, Hideyoshi's side. But the exact details of this role in this war are unclear. Later the same year, Musashi enters the service of uh, Osagarawa, uh, Tadano in the Harima province as a construction supervisor. What? Uh, he helps in the construction of Akashi Castle and helps organize the layout of the town. Just, you know, no, whatever, no big deal. I'm just going to build a castle and just help build the layout of the town. You know, just while I reflect on taking a break from my illustrious fighting career. Uh, during his stay, he teaches uh, martial arts, uh, adopts a, a son. After running his dojo successfully for years, Musashi's reputation as Japan's best swordsman grows even more. Honda uh, Tadamasa, Lord of Him uh, Himeji Castle, orders Miyake Gunbai, his most skilled samurai, to go to Musashi's dojo, show him what's up. Show him that he was actually the greatest swordsman. Musashi accepts the fight, leaves a choice of weapon to his opponent. Uh, Miyake's orders were to test his ability, not kill him, so he decides to cut a piece of bamboo from the garden to use as a weapon. Uh, meanwhile, Musashi you know, wields his bukoto. Uh, seconds after they face off, Gunbai is defeated. I mean, come on, bro. You can't, you can't step up to Musashi with some bamboo bullshit. Now when he's got his fa favorite wooden sword, that's crazy talk. Uh, 1622, his adopted son now grown, Musashi starts to wander across Japan again, uh, this time ending up in Edo in 1623 for a bit, then on to Yamagata City where he adopts a second son. In 1626, Musashi receives a visit from his now grown son who has uh, left him to serve another lord, uh, and, his, and his son in informs him that his lord has died and that he would now commit seppuku uh, following his master in death. And then he commits ritual suicide. Man, that shit is hardcore. Imagine, man, I guess, I guess that's, you know, you got to roll with the punch. That's just, that's the life they chose, but Jesus. For a short while in 1627, Miyamoto Musashi and his second son go to live in Agura uh, before wandering around Japan for seven years until 1634 when they settle down in Kokura to train and paint. You know, I'm just going to do some painting. Whatever. I've been kicking ass for a while, you know, training people and shit, you know, built a castle, you know, laid out a town. Now I'm going to fucking paint. 1634, Lord uh, Agaso, uh, Agasawara, who owns the castle, where he lives, organizes a uh, a non-lethal duel between uh, Musashi and a, and a spear specialist named Takata Matabai. As expected, Musashi, now 50-year-old uh, samurai, wins. You think about that. Been kicking ass from 13 to 50. <laughs> That's nuts. For 37 years. Just whooping ass. That is some sustained excellence. 1637, uh, Musashi, you know, 53, fights in the Christian rebellion of uh, Shimbara. Um, one of the very few turbulent events that occurred during the peaceful Edo period under the Tokugawa so, uh, shogunate. And in this battle, he injures, he gets injured by a fucking rock that falls on his leg. Of course, of course, that's how he gets injured. There's not a man alive that can hurt this dude, even, even at 53 years old. Only, only major battle injury. Only real injury he suffers his whole life is a rock that falls on his leg in battle. Fucking rocks, man. That was this one weakness, you know, all his training and he forgot to train how to, how to defend yourself from rocks. Oh, man. In hindsight, if he only would have focused more on rock training. Uh, 1641, Musashi writes the uh, Hiyoho uh, Sanju Go, or the 35, wait, Hiyoho Sanju Go, the 35 Instructions on Strategy. Uh, this was a book dedicated to his fighting philosophy and technique, and it would form the basis of his masterpiece, the Gorin Noshu, which would come into being two years later. Uh, in 1642, Musashi suffers attacks of neuralgia, a painful disorder of the nerves, probably, probably due to that damn rock attack. Feeling that his end is near in 1643, Musashi retires to a cave, uh, as legends do, uh, to write his Gorin Noshu, or the Book of Five Rings. He finishes it in the second month of 1645, gives it to his closest student. Now, the Book of Five Rings, the text uh, on uh, Kenjutsu, martial arts, and philosophy that you can still buy today. Many translations of the Gorin Noshu have been made over the years, and it enjoys an audience considerably broader than, jo than those just interested in martial arts. Uh, for instance, some business leaders find its discussion of conflict and how to take advantage of conflict to be relevant to their work. Uh, the five books refer to the idea that there are different elements of battle, just as there are different physical elements in life, as is believed in Buddhism, Shintoism, and other Eastern religions. Uh, so let's go over these real quick. The first, the first book, The Groundberg, serves as an introduction, uh, uses the metaphor of building a house to discuss martial arts, leadership, and training. 
A uh, quote from the book, it says, It is said the warriors is the twofold way of pen and sword, and he should have a taste for both ways. Even if a man has no natural ability, he can be a warrior by sticking assiduously to both divisions of the way. Generally speaking, the way of the warrior is resolute acceptance of death. Uh, then there's the water book, which describes Musashi's style uh, of two heavens, one style. Describes some basic technique, fundamental principles. A quote is, uh, if you merely read this book, you will not reach the way of strategy. Absorb the things written in this book. Do not just read, memorize, or imitate, but so that you realize the principle from within your own heart. Study hard to absorb these things into your body. I do like that kind of stuff, man. There's, there's books that I've read, uh, a few of them where I'll read them over and over uh, or, you know, like sections of them and really just kind of like let it sink in. Uh, like more books on like how to live as an artist, you know, uh, some books on just kind of like, you know, yeah, just some like business strategy, I guess. But it's like, I don't just read those like a novel. Like I read a little section, I'm like, and then just contemplate it on, you know, on, on it for a while. Um, there's the fire book, refers to the heat of battle, discusses matters such as different types of timing. Uh, you cannot profit from small techniques, particularly with full armor. Uh, when full armor is worn. My way of strategy is the sure method to win when fighting for your life, one man against five or ten. There is nothing wrong with the principle one man can beat ten, so a thousand men can beat ten thousand. Uh, number four is the wind book. The wind book discusses what Musashi uh, considers to be the failings of various contemporary schools of sword fighting, saying, my Ichi school is different. Other schools make accomplishments their means of livelihood, growing flowers and decoratively coloring articles in order to sell them. This is definitely not the way of strategy. Uh, I don't know. I guess he's shit talking about some flower growing. Whatever. You know, it's competitive. And then there's the Void Book. The Void Book is, an, a, is a short epilogue describing in more esoteric terms than the other books his thoughts on consciousness and the correct mindset. Uh, he says, What is called the spirit of the void is where there is nothing. It is not included in man's knowledge. Of course, the void is nothingness. By knowing things that exist, you can know that which does not exist. That is the void. I don't know. That, that, that's some serious pseudo Confucius might actually be really profound. Might just be a, a bunch of bullshit kind of quote to me. Right. You know, like when men know there is nothing, only then can he truly appreciate something like it sounds cool, but I don't, I don't know what it fucking means necessarily. A man who eats meat knows what it is to feel full, but a man who raises cattle knows what it means to be full. I just made that one up. You know, I feel like if I told you that Miyamoto wrote that, you might think, yeah, that's, that's fucking, that's pretty profound. Feels a little, a little too straightforward, but uh, yeah, it makes sense. Uh, Musashi's final teachings, the uh, Dokoro, or the way of walking alone, was written just one week before his death. While Musashi was giving away his possessions in preparation for uh, the next phase of his, of his spirits, you know, transcendence, whatever. Uh, in, in summary of Musashi's life, his will and philosophy, the 21 precepts of Dokoro are as follows. Number one, accept everything just the way it is. Two, do not seek pleasure for its own sake. Three, do not under any circumstances depend on a partial feeling. What? That one to me is kind of like the stuff I was just joking about. Like, is that profound? What does that even mean? Does it mean you got to be confident, fully confident in your choices? Uh, four is think lightly of yourself and deeply of the world. Uh, that one's solid. I like that one. You know, stay humble. Five is be detached from desire your whole life long. Oh, that's tough. Six, do not regret what you have done. Ooh, very tough, but I, but I like that one. Seven, never be jealous. I really struggle with that one. I'm always working on jealousy. Don't be jealous. Number eight, never let yourself be saddened by a separation. So not supposed to miss my kids when I'm on the road. I don't know. But I, but I guess, you know, like if you just missed them in some like sad sense, like what is really the point of that emotion? I do like a lot of this stuff in the kind of the soft world I feel like we live on now. Where a lot of this stuff to me is like, man, be fucking tough. You have a tough mind. Don't let your mind, don't allow your mind to be soft as much as you can help it. Don't fucking waste your time wistfully thinking about thoughts that don't, you know, improve your life. I like it. I like it. Um... Number eight, never let yourself be sad. Okay, I already said that was sad. Number nine, resentment and complaint are appropriate neither for oneself or others. Oh, okay. I mean, I do like that one, but about half my stand-up material is based on complaints. So that one I'm gonna have to struggle with. Uh, number 10, do not let yourself be guided by the feeling of lust or love. Come on. That's crazy talk. What are you, fucking robot? Number 11, in all things have no preferences. Eh, that one's even sillier to me than the last one. Like you clearly preferred to win some duels. Well, we all have preferences. Come on. Number 12, be indifferent to where you live. Mm, no, fuck that. Coeur d'Alene, way better than Battle Mountain, Nevada. I've been to both places, not even close. But but again, I do like this the whole thing of like, focus on your inner self, not on what surroundings happen to surround you, you know? Uh, number 13, do not pursue the taste of good food. Come on. Am I supposed to live on Brussels sprouts? 
Uh, number 14, do not uh, hold on to possessions you no longer need. Mm-hmm. Do not follow customary beliefs. Is 15 done? Uh, 16, do not collect weapons or practice with weapons beyond what is useful. Got it. 17, do not fear death. Working on it. Tough one, but working on it. 18, do not seek to possess either goods or fiefs from your old age or for your old age. Not totally sure what you're talking about here. Uh, uh, I guess that's like, why just be a pack rat? Why hold on to shit that you don't need when you're going to die? Number 19, respect Buddha and the gods without counting on their help. Okay. Uh, number 20, you may abandon your own body, but you, but you must preserve your honor. That's some samurai shit right there, man. Death before dishonor. And number 21, great way to end. Never stray from the way. Never stray from the way, bro. Never stray from the way. Solid closing rule. Well done, Musashi. Uh, I got a little too militant in points in the middle for me, but I, but I like the general flow of it. I, I get it. I get it. Musashi died not longer after finishing that, uh, possibly on June 13th, 1645, at the age of either 60 or 61. And that, of course, takes us out of this last Time Suck timeline. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. Okay, so that is a bit on the history of Japan up until the uh, through the age of the samurai. A bit on what it means to be a samurai. Looking at the life of one samurai. Uh, no idiots today, man. This episode fucking destroyed me. It's destroyed my brain. E- easily twice as much time as a normal episode. Love you guys, but fuck this uh, episode. Uh, <laughs> took way longer than a normal episode to try to figure out just the context of what it even means to have been Japanese and to help understand what it meant to be a samurai. Then all the words, the words. Uh, and I know I still have a lot to learn. Uh, Got to do some other Japanese sucks down the road, man. It is a fascinating culture to try to figure out. I, I am so glad that this one forced me to learn way more uh, than I ever would have otherwise about Japan and the samurai. Uh, I, I hope it was enjoyable. It was uh, probably not as comedic as some, just because I really had to just to focus on what in the hell I was talking about. Uh, okay, so now let's go over what we learned one more time with today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, the word samurai comes from the Japanese verb samurai, which means to serve someone. To look up to them. Uh, number two, from 1185 all the way to 1868, Japan was ruled by the shogunate, a feudal military style government, and the samurai warriors were the government's most important enfo- enforcer. Number three, Miyamoto Musashi, one of Japan's fiercest warriors, supposedly won over 60 duels and lost zero. He was the Chuck Norris of the samurai. Number four, women had a terrible during the samurai period, as they pretty much always do in history. Uh, If their samurai husband brought shame upon the family, had to kill himself, she also had to kill herself. And you thought sometimes you got mad at your husband. Man, catching him in bed with another woman, terrible, not as terrible as coming home and, and, you know, finding out you you have to kill yourself. Number five, new info. The arrival of guns greatly changed the way samurais did battle. It was one of the factors that would slowly lead to the downfall, as they were no longer just needed. In 1543, Japan was in the grips of a, a massive power struggle. The Ashigaga uh, shogunates entrenched for over a century could no longer control the many fiefdoms belonging to a powerful, uh, ambitious lords or, you know, to various powerful and ambitious lords. Armies were clashing with army, alliances shifting and reshifting. To the north were the uh, Asugis, to the east, the Jojos, and in the center between Kanto and Kyoto, the rising Oda and Takagawa clans. On August 25th of that year, uh, on on this uh, island of uh, Tanegashima, a typhoon blew ashore, a Chinese junk-like ship. On, uh, on board with three Portuguese sailors, crew of some 100 Chinese, and two rifles. And that day, Western civilization arrived appropriately in a storm. The lord of uh, Tanagashima, after watching one of the Portuguese shoot a duck, immediately saw the military significance of the gun. He purchased the two uh, uh, rifles for uh, 1,000 um, tails in gold each. And, uh, and, or, and or, yeah, it says tails of gold, so tails each in gold. Ordered his chief swordsmith to duplicate him. Within a year, 10 guns are made. And according to Noel Perrin, um, uh, this historian, within a decade, gunsmiths all over Japan were making the new weapon in quantity. By 1560, the use of firearms in large battles had begun. And 15 years after that, they were the decisive weapon in one of the greatest battles in Japanese history. That was at Nagashino, where uh, Oda Nobunaga, uh, who later became the most powerful lord of Japan, overwhelmed the Takadas or Takedas of the East by using foot soldiers armed with 3,000 guns and shooting in alternating rows of three. And uh, his army was able to mow down thousands of enemy samurai on horseback. I kind of a uh, really kind of sad bummer there that way. That's totally changed samurai war. These guys devoted to swords, martial arts. They've been training with that shit their whole lives, and then one day they you know they're riding on their horses towards this uh, army who just fucking shoot them down. 
That whole thing of like, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. Uh, the process of reversion was a gradual one, spawning more than two centuries. It started soon after the overwhelming success of this gun uh, in this battle. And the samurai realized that their status as a, as a you know, skilled swordsman was diminishing. Because now even a lowly peasant armed with, you know, one of these rifles could kill the noblest, most heroic warrior ever without even an introduction. You know, because in the past before, you know, sword, you know, hand to hand, uh, sword to sword fight, samurais would uh, sometimes bark out their names. And if their opponent allowed it, would boast of past accomplishments. I can only imagine what Musashi would do there. Um, like there's this uh, example from this 13th century epic tale of the uh, Aiki, uh, where this one guy says, in a mighty voice, he named his name saying, you have long heard of me. Now take a good look. I am Tutsi Nojomo Mishu, known to all of Mi Temple as a warrior worth a thousand men. And then they began to fight. And then the gun came along and it was just practical now to shoot first and introduce yourself later. And so went the samurai. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Well, there you have it. The samurai have been sucked. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, again, despite, you know, spending more time on that one than any other suck, I, I, I don't know that I know as much as I should about Japan. Such a mysterious country still. Feels like another planet to me in some ways, you know? I, I do look forward to doing more sucks based in Japan in the future to learn more about it. Maybe some China sucks as well. You know, that and Korea seem to be the two most similar cultures. We just we just live in a fascinating world, don't we? Think about all the billions of lives that exist right now and all the different cultures just on Earth right now. Each human, the star of their own unique story, the brightest star in their own sky. Think about how different uh, each of those lives are. You know, every person we talk about in these stories, are, their heart beats are, you know, just like yours. Or once beat, you know, their lives was, you know, are or what were important, as important to them as yours is to you right now. You know, whether they were one of the greatest samurai of all time or just a, a common merchant or peasant. Really overwhelming to think about the, just the complexity of our world. Cracks me up when people ask if I'm worried about like running out of topics. I'm like, what are you fucking talking about? If I clone myself and somehow could do 10 different sucks a day every day, right? I would still leave most stones unturned even if I lived to like 100, Right, you know, uh, even after, even after me and my clone army finally die and return our carbon to that big carbon bank known as Earth, there will never be a shortage of incredible tales. Uh, you just gotta know how to find them. Uh, big thanks to the Time Suck team, the High Priestess of the Suck Harmony Vela Camp, Jesse Guardian of Grammar Dobner, Reverend Doctor Joe Paisley, Time Suck High Priest Alex Dugan, the Bit Elixir team, Danger Brain, Space Lizards and Merch Wizards, Axis Apparel, Queen of the Suck, Boss of Damn Near Everything, Lindsay Cummins. Uh, big thanks again to OG Bojangles Research Assistants, the Lily Twins, for finding so much great info about this uh, about this topic. Man, Reba and Sarah, hammers of knowledge. And and thanks again uh, for all the kind words this past month about, uh, you know, understanding how things uh, have changed and how there just isn't uh, the time to do the bonus sucks the way we're doing the sucks now, these bonus episodes anymore. This, this week reaffirmed that for me. No way I could keep cranking out three episode weeks like this uh, every month, including, you know, with the secret sucks. Uh, excited just to focus on being very passionate about, you know, one subject each week with Time Suck. And coming this week, that's Tesla. This Monday, you know, we're sucking a space lizard voted into a topic, the Serbian-American madman, Nikola Tesla. Tesla helped electrify the world with his contributions to alternating current. He created one of the world's uh, first wireless remote controls. So thank him whenever you have to don't, you know, you don't have to get up off the couch and change the channel. He, un he unveiled that one at the Madison Square Garden. Uh, or at Madison Square Garden, excuse me, New York City in 1898. He helped invent radio transmission. He was the nemesis of fellow inventor Thomas Edison, inventor of the light bulb. They had a they had a nerd versus nerd battle, the wage of, uh, or I guess it was the war of currents in the 1880s. Modern mass communication systems largely based on Tesla's inventions. Lived a long, very eccentric life. Uh, invented so much. He, he was a brilliant mad scientist uh, who we owe much of our modern technological advances to. And I'm excited to suck him this next week and find out if the space lizards chose wisely. And right now I am excited to listen to today's Time Sucker updates. Updates. Get your Time Sucker updates. All right, kicking today's updates off with a hilarious update from a uh, from the Children of God Suck on Monday. Time Sucker Jody Johns writes in with uh, "Hey Master Sucker, just listened to the last episode about the Children of God cult and I, and I knew you were bullshitting about the uh, CDC reports." of the uh, backside loving going on. But it's kind of true. My, mo <laughs> my mother became a full-time nurse in 1969 until she retired in 2013. She says at least twice a month since she started nursing, someone has come into the ER no matter where she worked with something stuck up their asses. In the 70s, she said it was a lot of cucumbers and carrots. 80s were hard because it was more animals like mice and gerbils getting stuck deep inside and suffocating. 
and it was very gross on, you know, to get them out. Uh, she says the nineties were just, you know, full of dumb shit. Thanks to the jackass movies, a lot of toy cars and Barbie heads, but mainly now men and women alike come in with very large dildos, broken wine bottles and eggplants. <laughs> just thought you needed to know knowledge and Nimrod. Well, thank you space lizard. I can tell from the knowledge. Of Nimrod. Oh my God. Holy shit. Broken wine bottles. Is that done willingly to you? I mean, what the fuck? And eggplants, Jesus, I gotta, I gotta talk to Lindsay about all this. I mean, let's just say that maybe, hypothetically, I occasionally try to talk her into some some backdoor loving, and she gets nervous and scared. You know, not not like it's not like I'm John Holmes, but I'm also not Tiny Tim. But I'm no wine bottle. I'm no large eggplant. Uh, and cucumbers, carrots, I kind of get, but cucumbers, I don't get. I don't see how that works. They're they're, they're brittle. You know, they can break easy when uh, when pressure is applied from the side. Uh, I guess a carrot could too, but they, but they got all those like ridges, you know? And I thought the anal gerbils, that was just mostly urban legend. According to various websites, it, it is urban legend, but I have no reason not to believe your mom, Jody. I've, I've, I've never gotten so bored that I've just thought, you know what? I got to figure out how to get a small creature in my ass. But now that you, now that you brought this up, I did just Google, how do I get a gerbil into my ass? Uh, I didn't, I didn't even use private browsing to do that, by the way. I didn't even, I don't even bother anymore. I, I never clear my search history because I just, uh. I'm highly amused by the type of autofills I now get. You know, my search history is the most perverse and dark search history ever at this point. According to Wikipedia and Urban Dictionary, sticking a gerbil up your ass is known as gerbiling. Of course it is. Uh, some variations of reporting about gerbiling suggest that the rodent uh, is covered in a psychoactive substance like cocaine prior to being inserted. Uh, yeah, that makes sense to me. Like, like I don't feel like you really strongly consider uh, sticking a gerbil up your ass unless you've been doing a lot of blow. Uh, the act of gerbiling, according to the internet, is very simple. In most instances, it involves uh, you, you stick a tube in your ass. <laughs> you stick the gerbil in that tube, and then uh, sometimes you you put like a, you you light a like a like a lighter. You put some fire on the other end of the tube, so it just scares the gerbil uh, into burrowing up into your ass. And then sometimes, supposedly, like you declaw them as a safety precaution. I would think uh, <laughs> there are stories in the web about luring the gerbil up into your ass with like a piece of cheese. I don't fucking buy that. Like, do you get a piece of cheese stuck way up in your ass and then hope that gerbil follows it? What in the fuck? I wonder if you like, do you do that alone or with a partner? I, w- I feel like you have to have a team to get a gerbil in your butt. It reads very BDSM to me. It feeds, reads very much like you have a sex life and you just find it fun to, f- you know, figure out what you can stick in the sex life's butt. This That's a level of partying I've never participated in. But now that I talk about it, I do kind of want to go to a weird party like that as an observer. I want to, just out of morbid curiosity, like I like I feel like if I was watching some gerbiling, uh, at one point I would run out of the room to throw up, but then immediately run back into the room to to watch more of the gerbiling. What about the gerbil in this situation? What a horrible death to suffocate in someone's ass, to literally die suffocating inside someone's ass. Uh, but before that, probably pleasant for the gerbil. I mean, they they do like to let you know burrow. They live in little tunnels, you know. And what if they crawled too far? Could they make it inside your large intestine? Could they make it inside your small intestine? What would the stomach acid do to him? Fuck, I'm, I'm, now I'm done. Now I'm done. Thank you, Jody. You got way inside my head with that one. Uh, let's move on to an interesting R. Bud Dwyer update coming in from Time Sucker Jason Bame. Jason writes, all hail the Suckmaster Supreme. Just wanted to take a minute to tell you how much I love the show and wanted to give you an update on the Bud Dwyer episode. I live in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania and, uh, and was five years old at the time of the incident uh, when this happened. I don't remember seeing it happen on live TV. I guess I was lucky to be off plane or doing something else in that snowy day. But my girlfriend, who was two years older than me, saw it as it aired. I also wanted to share with you and the cult of the curious that my connection to this incident goes deeper than that. I'm a youth leader at my local church. And as I was talking about the episode with my friend and mentor there, he shared with me that he knew the Dwyer family very well. And then at the time of Bud's death was dating Dee Dee. That is nuts. So he's dating Bud's uh, Dwyer's daughter. I had to ask him if he uh, thought that Bud had taken the money or not. He told me that he asked Bud that very question in the Dwyer home. My friend believes with all his heart that Bud was an innocent man. Ugh. Thanks for letting me share this with you and all the people listening. Keep on sucking, Jason Bame. Wow. Man, Dayton Bud's daughter when that went down. That is intense. And uh, what a fantastic update, Jason. Thank you for sending that in. That poor bastard, man. My mind wanders over to Bud Dwyer often since we did that suck. What a... What a strange example of extreme courage, you know, like, and, and, and very kind of fascinating to think about right now with the samurai stuff we just talked about, like, you know, uh, in a way it felt like, you know, Bud uh, committed seppuku, you know, he felt like he died to restore honor to his family. Wow, man, uh, seemed very courageous in that way. 
Okay, so uh, uh, one last update today. I tried to find an email. I tried to find another one, an email that came in regarding someone having a personal interaction with the Children of God cult. But dang it, I just couldn't find it. So sorry about that, whoever sent that in. I, th I thought I had it marked. Could not find it trying various search terms in the email history. Uh, but we do have a good one coming in from Time Sucker Clint Dunsworth uh, about Chicken Joe. Uh, it says, Dear Reverend Dr. Uh, Major Sensei, Professor, General Prime Minister, former roommate of the suck. Uh, praise be to Bojangles, all hail Nimrod and his grand prophet, Chikatilo. Oh, man. And may sweet Lucifina re reward me for this update, which I feel obligated to share with you today. I'd like to start with a bit of fanboying here. Uh, and then I have a ra rather crucial update regarding Mr. Bogba Blayboa, uh, Chicken Joe. Um, and then if I may be so bold, a topic suggestion. First, I just want to say I've been sucking hard and long since the episode about clown, the clown scare of 2016. Oh, yeah. I live in Kansas City, Missouri, and heard you do an interview with local morning radio show Johnny Dare. Love Johnny Dare. He does a lot of charity work, by the way. Gay, as you know, I'm sure. Gave Time Suck a listen at work that day and have been sucking ever since. And I confess I am not a space lizard yet. But the good news is I'll be making the last payment on my car this month, which means I'll have some extra income from each paycheck from now on. Plenty enough to officially peel my face off and reveal the reptilian head beneath. With that out of the way, here's the Chicken Joe update. And thank you for that, by the way. The truth of the matter is that Chicken Joe is not some random piney nickname given to a pimp named Joe. The fact is there is a reason that Chicken Joe comes up relating to the Candyman story. The term chicken, as it relates to prostitution, is a word used for underage prostitutes. Damn it, I did find that out this week. As such, Chicken Joe is a pimp that specializes in dealing with underage prostitutes, hence his association with Dean Coral, the Candyman killer. Just got done listening to your Children of God episode, and I found I could no longer keep this update to myself regarding the newest member of the Time Suck Pantheon. With this in mind, rather than condemning the children of God, it would be more likely that Chicken Joe was a card-carrying member. Dang it. Reed, the only difference between Chicken Joe and the Candyman or Chikatilo is that at least Chicken Joe wasn't killing kids, but he was still screwing them, or at the very least selling them to be screwed. Not exactly a moral high horse for him to be on. Now, I'm not saying that Chicken Joe should stop coming by to drop his words of wisdom on us every now and then, considering we get to hear from Chikatilo every now and then. Just thought you might want some more context on where Chicken Joe got his name. Speaking of cults, however, uh, uh, just I've got another one that I think you would love to suck on. The uh, Om uh, Shikari, uh, oh man, pronounce uh, Om Shinrikyo. Shinrikyo. Uh, this is a Japanese cult that more or less turned into a terrorist sect that launched a sarin gas attack on a Tokyo subway with horrendous results. Oh, yep, I'm familiar. Assassinations, chemical weapons, gruesome punishments with their own members, and reportedly they were extremely close to obtaining a nuclear weapon. This was basically the Japanese version of Scientology, only their leader decided to go full-blown militaristic. Anyways, thank you for all you do. You definitely helped my mindless cubicle work days go just a bit faster. From a future space lizard, keep on sucking, Clint Dunsworth. Thank you for that, Clint. Thank you. And yes, uh, thanks for another great Japanese suck subject for the future. Uh, I appreciate it. And, and I feel like after touching on Japan twice now, it's like I do want to get back in there because I, I, I want to go through one sucks episode about Japan where I'm not struggling uh, over the words. And yeah, bummer about how the real Chicken Joe got his name. Uh, for the suck world, though, you know, Bizarro Chicken Joe, he just, he just loves chicken. So going forward, I'm just going to, you know, that's that's the real Chicken Joe, fake Chicken Joe, just a dude. He's not a good dude. He's a pimp. Uh, but more than pimping, he just loves chicken. He loves, he loves eating chicken. He loves his chicken. He loves chicken-related fashion accessories. Uh, thanks for all the extra information, suckers. Love you fine folks. Thanks for being the planet's very best meat sacks. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Well, that's all until Monday. Uh, hail Nimrod. Uh, don't commit seppuku if you feel like you've done something dishonorable, and don't make your wife do it either. Uh, the age of the samurai is over. The age of time suck just getting started. Keep on sucking. Because I got Japan on my brain and fucking banjos.